brand in particular, you're spoiled to have here. Because Everybody, welcome to the to the launch conference of uh, Erasmus Without Paper in Ghent, Ghent University, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mieke van Herwegen, who is our vice rector. Good morning, honourable guests, dear colleagues, dear participants. Today, I enjoy the honor and the pleasure of welco welcoming you all at Ghent University for the Erasmus Without Paper launch conference. The traditional setting and venue of the Aula building where we are today might seem in contrast with the state-of-the-art topic of, the, of this conference, but at Ghent University, we strongly believe that being a long-established university shouldn't refrain us from being active in innovative projects like Erasmus without paper. Last year, I, don't, I think some of you know, Ghent University celebrated its 200th anniversary. The university was founded in 1817 as a Latin-speaking state university by William I, King of the Netherlands. We were still part of the Netherlands at that time. The neoclassical temple that was named as the palace of the university where we gather here today was the first university building and is one of the many historical landmarks in the city of Ghent. You might already have had the chance to visit the medieval city of Ghent and if you haven't done so, I hope you will find some time to walk, to walk around and to experience its authentic atmosphere. In the small country of Belgium, the city of Ghent is an iconic symbol of the past. Since it was erected in the 8th century, it was the birthplace of Emperor Charles V in the 15th century and the cradle of industrialization of the European continent in the early 19th century. So we have a long history. Nowadays, the city of Ghent is becoming more and more famous because of the unique mix of a wonderful past and a contemporary vibrant city. Part of the city's secret is undoubtedly its university. Recently, current alderman and future mayor of the city of Ghent, Matthias de Klerk, has mentioned in a speech that Ghent would not be the city it is today without its university. Needless to say that Ghent University has a close relation with the city of Ghent. Every academic year, thousands of students provide Ghent with a fresh, young vibe. The university is a city university. It's not a campus university, which means that university buildings are spread over and around the city center, leading to a very dynamic atmosphere with lots of activities taking place throughout the whole year. Being the largest employer in the province also, and with its research activities, joint ventures and spin-off companies, the university adds substantially to the reputation of Ghent as an innovative city contributing to the welfare of the whole region. So, I hope it's clear to you that Ghent University is thriving. All the charts point steeply and steadily upwards. Student numbers continue to go up and have now passed the 45,000 mark. About 15,000 employees work at Ghent University, including almost 1,500 professors. Scientific output in terms of PhD degrees obtained and articles published is increasing year after year. And also, our international reputation is growing. In the prestigious uh, Shanghai ranking, we climbed up to number 61, outflanking all our competitors in the country. I don't need to tell you that a top 100 position is both a much prized asset and a hard won achievement. And we're very proud of it. I think we, sh we can share that with you. But this is not uh, the reason why we are here today in Ghent. Ghent University is actually a symbolic place to hold, to hold this launch conference, as we have hosted some other project milestones as well. In June 2013, the first informal meeting specifically organized about the idea that led to the project Erasmus Without Paper took place only a few hundred meters from here at the premises of our university. Many of the stakeholders that took part in that meeting are present here today as well. And I especially welcome them and thank them for the productive co cooperation that we've had since then. In November 2015, we were pleased to host the kickoff meeting of the first Erasmus Without Paper project. 
What strikes me is that in such short time frame, such a highly ambitious concept has been developed and even the first implementation steps have already been taken successfully. However, let me quote from the welcome speech of the first Erasmus Without Paper meeting by our former director of internationalization because I'm truly convinced that these words from 2013 are still relevant today. And I quote, I know from experience about the practical problems that exchange students are faced with and the sometimes contradictory procedures they have to endure before, during, and after their exchange period. And I am convinced that a project such as Erasmus Without Papers, if successful, could make a huge difference. I have been told that technically it is not such a complicated issue, but I can assure you that bringing the universities who are active in exchange mobility to the point where they are willing to accept standardization and adopt a European platform will be a major psychological challenge as it involves change, even drastic change." Unquote. Needless to say that all stakeholders who are present here today bear a responsibility in adapting the changes that a digital exchange of information entails. We will need to trust the data that we receive from our partner institutions instead of documents duly signed and stamped. There is an important responsibility for the Europe European Commission and national agencies in facilitating or even, dare I say so, explicitly stimulating this mind shift. However, also representatives of universities across Europe who are present here today have an important role to play. You can all help us spread the message and convince your colleagues and partner universities about the new future of the Erasmus administration without the traditional stamps and signatures we're all used to. And if we are able to do so, we have cause, cause for celebration. Celebration, because today we open up the Erasmus Without Paper network for all of you. The vast interest in this conference, as you can see, it's a, um, a full house today, uh, shows that we may expect a lot of new institution, institutions joining the network in the months to come. And if you all embrace the increased digital thinking underpinning the network, we will be able to make immense progress in the direction of a truly digital administration of all Erasmus exchanges towards the next Erasmus program. And once this is achieved, we can start thinking about opening up the principles beyond the borders of the Erasmus program countries, some of which are also represented here today at this conference. Erasmus without papers is about connecting systems, but we shouldn't forget about why we are doing this. Our main aim is to connect people. By reducing the administrative burdens on Erasmus exchanges, we do believe that we can do more to support our incoming and outgoing exchange students, to invest in the quality of the exchange experience itself, and to focus on international and intercultural competencies for all students. The importance of a focus on quality of internationalization and broadening in internationalization to all students can't be stressed sufficiently. Quality enhancement should be our overarching goal, and to achieve this goal, we can work on the quality of internationalization itself. But we should also use internationalization as a quality indicator for our educational policies, and hence, we need to focus on internationalization for all students, not only those who are lucky to be mobile. To work on quality enhancement, we need data to provide insights on where we are now. Interconnecting systems and exchanging information on a large scale has the potential of delivering the data we need for this quality enhancement. On the one hand, it can support us in defining indicators to monitor our quality and policies. On the other hand, it helps us to make data-informed and therefore better decisions. Inside our university, we are already working on data governance in our educational quality approach and we are eager to work with our partners around the world to improve these practices. A large number of Ghent University's activities in internationalization are intertwined within the developments in the European higher education area in general and the opportunities offered by the Erasmus program in particular. While taking advantage of the opportunities which Erasmus offered and continues to offer, 
Ghent University, through a collaborative approach with its partners, also contributed to the overall development of the Erasmus program. And last year, the European Association for International Education, EAIE, granted us its award for innovation in internationalization and explicitly mentioned these achievements, including Erasmus Without Paper, in its motivation for the award, and we're very grateful for that. Erasmus Without Paper is indeed one of the most recent examples in this regard, and we're happy to continue working on it in the years to come. Now, we hope that the collaborative mindset that is inherent to the sector of internationalization, internationalization will help all of us to contribute to the realization of indeed an Erasmus without paper in the near future. I wish you all a very interesting and productive launch conference, and I hope that many of you can help us in digitizing the Erasmus administration and internationalization in general in the years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. I think now is the time for the next speaker, who is uh, Ms. Vanessa, Vanessa Dubillet Santon, <laughs> sorry, shifting to French, <laughs> who is uh, the head of the unit of the unit of, for higher education and the director of general education and culture of the European Commission. I'd like to give you the floor, Ms. Dubillet Santon. Well, um, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you uh, today uh, to, for this uh, key milestone that the Erasmus Weather Paper Project is going to present you today. All right, so yes, a key milestone to simplify the future Erasmus program that will start in 2021 for next period of seven years. So let me present you a little bit what are our objectives for this future program. You might have heard, I'm sure many of you, that we are not planning a revolution as it has been the case seven, well, a few years ago in 2014, but an evolution. And this Erasmus Without Paper project is part of this evolution, meaning that you know that we are now in the process of negotiating this future program with the European Parliament, with the Council, but here there is a general agreement from all the different stakeholders that we should keep the current structure of the Erasmus Plus program with the first key action dedicated to mobility activities, the second key action dedicated to cooperation, and the third key action dedicated to policy support. So this will stay. But now we have a, a dream. We have a very big ambition by 2025 to create a European education area within the European Union. An education area where anybody, students, apprentices, pupils, teachers, researchers can move freely within the European Union to study, to learn, to work, to do research. And for this, it is essential to remove any barriers to this mobility. Being on recognizing um, any training, any learning period abroad, or any education qualification for the purpose of accessing future learning, further learning. And this is why I'm very happy to tell you that uh, last week, education ministers agreed, adopted unanimously a council recommendation to make this automatic recognition of periods abroad, learning periods abroad and academic qualification automatically recognized by 2025. So that is already a very important milestone to make this dream a reality by 2025. Another uh, key milestone to support this objective is 
a new action, European universities, that's what I will mention in a moment. And a third one um, is the European Student Card Initiative. So this is really a mandate that we have received from the head of states and heads of governments last year in Gothenburg to really, they asked us, the Commission, together with the Parliament and the Member States, to deliver on this uh, roadmap and on this key and ambitious objective. And of course, the fourth, the fourth one is obviously to have a more inclusive and accessible Erasmus program to be able to support and to deliver on this European education area. So inclusion and accessibility is the top of our priority for the future program. And obviously, making it simpler through uh, what will be presented today and tomorrow with the Erasmus Without Paper project is, is fundamental and is key in that respect. More participatory, so giving access not only to a wider range of students and learners, but also more participatory in terms of giving um, easier access to a wider range of higher education institutions across Europe as well. More forward-looking, that means that Erasmus has always been bottom-up and it should stay a bottom-up program because this has been key to making it a success. While at the same time, giving us a bit more flexibility to invest in forward-looking skills where we, we feel there is a need. More international, we tested with the current program uh, already, um, international mobility beyond Europe. We've been that there is a huge interest, we've seen the benefit of it, so we want to expand it while simplifying it where possible. And last but not least, making it simpler, less bureaucratic, to make it more inclusive and accessible. So let's see more in detail. What does it mean more concretely? Oops. Okay. Um, so to support this future program, and there is a e cap with the front, but okay. Um, so uh, the, the Commission has proposed 30 billion euros for this future program, so doubling the current program which means uh, three times together with the Erasmus Plus national agencies. I've seen some of them in the room together with higher education institutions and student uh, organizations. We are currently discussing on the concrete implementation of this objective. But what comes up a lot when we discuss all together is on top of the mobility, as you know them now, to offer on top additional opportunities with more flexible mobility formats. Meaning, we know that some students are not necessarily mobile for at least two or three months for personal reasons. If we want to include as well more major students who have children, who have, you know, for whatever reason, we need to provide opportunities, opportunities for them as well. So we want to support, for example, what we call blended mobility. So a shorter period of time uh, being physically abroad, but blended with a virtual cooperation. Um, 
as well to make it more inclusive, easier to access, simplification and digitalization of the entire administrative process of mobility is essential. We have increased a lot the quality with the Erasmus program and we see it when we analyze and when we are monitoring the results of the current Erasmus Plus program with a new charter, new learning agreements that have been introduced uh, with Erasmus Plus. But we also heard from you that it has been terribly difficult because you didn't have necessarily the tools to properly implement it, to properly and exchange easily information with your peers. And this is exactly what the European Student Code Initiative is about. Now, I mentioned before targeted mobility in forward-looking schemes. I will give you just one example. We have launched this year the Digital Opportunity Traineeships Initiatives. And what it is about? It's about we have injected additional funding from Horizon 2020, the other European program targeted at research innovation. And here we have used that opportunity to give more opportunities for students. Students in all in all academic disciplines, not only students in IT, but important is for them to develop their, their digital skills. Why? Because we know that all of them, all of us, need to improve our digital skills to be prepared for this uh, transition and the future world. We know that many of the current jobs will disappear. Even mine in 10 years' time will be completely different. Yours, all of yours. So we need to get prepared for that. And this is what this, um, this uh, new initiative is about. And we need a program that is flexible to address these needs with a society that is progressing very quickly. International dimension, I said, more opportunities, more simpler opportunities in the future. There are already uh, opportunities available in the current program uh, to attract uh, the best talents around the world, to attract them in Europe, but also for Europeans. Here we would like to provide even more uh, opportunities for European students and staff to um, to initiate cooperation with partners or continue cooperation with partners um, beyond Europe. And an active participation, an active participation of all the alumni, all those that have, uh, that have benefited from Erasmus to get them even more engaged, to reach out to those who have not yet benefited to the program. This is a key objective for us as well in the future. Wider range as well of cooperation models. We want to offer opportunities to all higher education institutions across Europe, depending on their needs. Starting with cooperation projects, as you know them as strategic partnerships now, this is the first entry point, I would say, to Erasmus Plus to develop your international cooperation with your peers abroad. But we need as well to provide more opportunities to those that are a little bit more advanced. And this is the objective of the Partnerships for Innovation with Knowledge Alliances and forward-looking projects. Here to go a little bit deeper in terms of ambition, in terms of long-term strategy, alliances to reinforce the cooperation with the, with the with the world of, uh, 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 with, the, with the labor market, with, uh, with businesses, but uh, much broader than, than that, all the, the, the society. Forward-looking projects to be able to anticipate what the future will be, exactly how the Erasmus with on paper project has done, for example. And then uh, to move towards partnerships for excellence. I'm sure you all know about the fantastic opportunities provided by Erasmus Mendes to develop joint, um, joint curriculum at a master level, but also at doctoral uh, level under Marie Slodowska Curie Action. So this is an additional opportunity to reinforce the, the, the cooperation within Europe and beyond. And then a new opportunity that we have uh, uh, launched a call two weeks ago to test this concept, and these are the European universities, which is the most ambitious and advanced cooperation model. It goes well beyond the objective of Erasmus Mendes. 
Here, our objective is to support higher education institutions to really devise a long-term strategy in education, but also where possible together with research and innovation. To do what? To not only to develop new joint curriculum, but to completely open your existing curriculum to all the students that are part of this alliance, meaning that any students that are part of these European universities should feel at home and be free to move among the other, the other partners. So you see the importance of facilitating and recognizing these mobility opportunities. And this can only be possible if there is full trust between the partners committed to drive a common strategy and be the, the, the champions in terms of uh, innovation, teaching and learning, providing all these different opportunities um, to learn and to be well prepared for the future society that is moving very fast. Cross-disciplinary exchange is very important. Having students working together from different disciplines, together with researchers, together with companies, to provide solutions to all the challenges that Europe is facing. So you see that it's highly ambitious, but very much needed as well. But our objective is to provide all these different set of opportunities to your institutions, depending on your needs and where, where you are and where you stand, and providing the opportunities to further develop. So if you want to know more about the European universities, just to let you know that we are organizing an information session next Tuesday, 18 of December, 10.30. It will be live streamed so that all of you can, can um, hear it and listen to it. Now, let's come back to this European Student Card Initiative. As I told you, we received this mandate from the heads of states and heads of governments to go ahead. To go ahead to do what? Why do we need that? To make it easier for students to enroll for mobility abroad, find information and support. This is key if we want to, to support many more students and making it easier for students to be mobile. We need to give them a single entry point, easily accessible, for example, the Erasmus Plus mobile app that we launched uh, last year to be able to get access not only to information, this is the first point, but also to manage easily all the different steps before, during, and after the mobility, from the learning agreement up to the recognition of the CTS credits, for example. But also to get access to the online public services that are available on the universities, and uh, I'm very happy to have the coordinator of the Student Card Initiative here present. This is also a key aspect of this initiative. And for universities, why it is important? What is the benefit from you? It's to be able to give you a support to manage an increased support of um, an increased number, sorry, of mobile students. So these are the key objectives of this initiative. What, how? How are we going to do that? The objective is not to replace all the IT systems that you are using now, but it's to connect them between each other. With what we are aiming at is to have a single entry point for universities to um, exchange all that uh, information, and the Erasmus Without Paper is key in that respect, and a single entry point for the students to get access um, to information, but also to exchange all that information through the Erasmus Plus mobile app. <laughs> to do what? To exchange electronically all information from the interinstitutional agreement up to the online uh, learning agreement, so before the mobility, to agree on what the student will, uh, will uh, follow abroad and how it will be recognized. Then to give them access before they arrive on the campus abroad to accommodation, to transportation, to library, etc. And then 
to be able to get their CTS credits um, fully recognized based on the learning and the learning agreement, thanks to the, to the transfer of transcript of recalls. So this is this entire administrative process that we want to cover through this European Student Card Initiative. But as I said, our objective is not to replace the IT tools that you are using, you will be able to continue using them, but you will be able to make sure that they can be connected with each other, with all your peers. And this is where the Erasmus Without Paper project is essential. So we are supporting all these initiatives and all these different steps through a number of European projects. First, Erasmus Plus projects like Erasmus Without Paper, the online learning agreement, the Erasmus Plus mobile app, MREX for the uh, recognition of ECTS credits, and the European Student Card for online service, getting access to online services abroad. But we are also funding uh, CEF projects, so Connecting Europe facility, to also develop a unique student identifier, which is very important to connect all the different uh, systems together for an authentication, um, a secure authentication online. And now, as from early next year, we are as well uh, supporting My Academic ID project, which will bring all the different partners from these different projects together to work in the, sign, in the same uh, direction to deliver by 2021 all the support to provide you all the IT infrastructure and support to go ahead. So, as I said, we are not going to build a giant new IT tool, but collecting all the tools that you are using. We are not going to produce a new uh, European student card, physical student card, to replace the cards that your students are using. No. We will build on what exists, adding a chip or an autogram on what exists. We will also develop a partnership. We are um, discussing with ISU, with other student organizations to see how we can build on what we, they already provide to your students to see how they can make it available for any European students on the campus together. <coughs> so now, by when? So, of course, there is a key milestone that will be explained to you today and tomorrow with this uh, Erasmus Without Paper project. Of course, as you have understood, more will come as well in the next, in the next uh, two years with this My Academy ID and all the other ones to be able to, be able to provide all this all this uh, infrastructure to connect all the different existing tools by 2021 when we will launch the future program. And here I want to be clear, it will be a step-by-step -step rollout for the universities and for the students. We will not launch uh, um, uh, a new functionality if it has not been properly tested and if it runs well. Why? Because if we want to make this initiative a success, it's important that all of you participate in it. Yeah? Otherwise, it cannot work. Erasmus can work only if there is trust um, between all the different partners. And for that, it is essential that all of you take part in this initiative. And we have only two years to get prepared for that before the future program. Two years is not a lot when we know the diversity of tools that you are using. So we need to make sure within these two years that all your IT systems are adapted to be able to connect to this, to this system so that by 2021 you can all exchange information about student, student data to make sure that the future program can run as smoothly as possible in a very more simplified way as compared to the current one. And by 2021, our dream would be to make it available even beyond the Erasmus program for all students that are mobile across the European Union. So my message to all of you is that it's really time to join this digital revolution, 
to make Erasmus easy, you have all dreamt about it, that by a click, I exaggerate a little bit, but almost you can exchange all the information with your peers, and now time is now to, to test it. Thank you very much. Warm thanks to Vanessa for this uh, excellent introduction as to what the viewpoint of the European Commission is. We don't have a lot of time for questions right now, and we're going to have a day and a half to talk with each other and to run through this, some of these issues. But it wouldn't be entirely fair to not ask you whether there is one or maybe two very burning questions that you'd like to put to our distinguished speaker. I take it that means that it was an excellent presentation for which I thank you very much. And uh, thank you indeed for joining us, Vanessa. Pleasure. I think it is my pleasure to introduce you a very esteemed colleague and the coordinator of the Erasmus Without Paper project, Valer Mus. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here in such large numbers. Thank you f uh, to the university, my alma mater, uh, to, for hosting us and everything. So it is a real pleasure for me to be here and to talk to you a little bit about uh, Erasmus uh, without paper. Whether it will be all you ever wanted to know about it, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'll try and uh, to, uh, tell you something about it. This is how it all started. This is one of the iconic pictures which was used by Luciano Sasso in, uh, in, in the very, very first meeting. And this is what he said, was Erasmus like uh, lots of paper. That's where it uh, basically started as a picture. Um, and um, I'm sorry that Luciano couldn't be here, but he is the, also the inventor of the name Erasmus without paper. So from Sapienza University, I think we should give credit to where credit is due. Okay, so the history. Uh, it's a long time ago. Uh, some of you go way back, Victoriano, uh, for example, before Erasmus, and there was one very obscure named uh, project, uh, RS3G. Janina was part of that as well, Mobility Project. And that started uh, a long time ago, and even I was not part of that at that, at that time. But the first informal meeting of stakeholders was in December 2012 in Brussels, in the University, uh, the university Foundation. And then the first formal meeting of a consortium was in Ghent in June 2013. And that's where we decided, okay, we really want to do something about it. Before it was like informal, it was a lot of talk, there was a lot of ideas, um, I remember very uh, concrete discussions about the, the, the picture or the analogy that we should use to, to describe with uh, Erasmus our paper. We're all past that. And in fact, there were two more consortium meetings when we decided, okay, let's really make it into a project. Let's really submit it. And then it started off in Ghent, again in Ghent, huh? the first kickoff meeting in November 2015. Um, and that was the present, more or less present consortium because we had the big problem of reducing the number of partners. The commission kept saying, saying to us, you have too many partners because there were so many people who were interested. In the end, we, we, we were able to reduce it in some way uh, to 12. And these 12 original partners are still part of the Erasmus project uh, today. So we, we worked on the pilot in the first meeting and uh, then we had a follow-up project which is still going on, which started in the beginning of this year and which will end at the end uh, of next year, I can still say. And that was launched in Warsaw in uh, January 2019. That should, of course, be 18. Uh, and the project will end in the 
the 31st of December 2019. So this is more or less the history about Erasmus Without Paper. Some of you have been part of it from the very beginning. Uh, there are three extra partners in the new one. Uh, so we were, we strengthened, we, we worked out what was really needed to make it a really international um, project. Okay, there was an ambitious agenda for the pilot phase. We wanted to work out the mobility scenarios and we did a huge desk research with more than 1,000 universities responding to our questionnaire, which was at that time probably and perhaps still is one of the largest uh, questionnaires among higher education institutes and we worked out what is what are the scenarios that we can actually use how how does it actually work nowadays this seems relatively simple but at the time it was not so simple of course we had to have common data models eh? it's easy to send data and to get them back but you all know how the Americans use different dates or the different description of dates that we do eh? um, 9-11 uh, doesn't mean 9-11 to us, does it? it uh, it's 11 September. Anyway, th so you have to make sure that all of these differences in the way you deal with data are actually taken into account. Of course, you have the transport protocols and the standards, how you're actually going to exchange that, what is the technical uh, solution to that. And something that took us a long time to decide or to work on uh, and which keeps changing all the time is, of course, the security and the privacy issues. I remember very, very uh, enthusiastic, to say a nice word, uh, very enthusiastic discussions about how safe do we have to, to be. Uh, and, of course, the technical people say it has to be extremely safe, nothing can go through, the Russians are there, or whatever. Uh, what happens, this is a question I regularly get, what happens if the Russians uh, discover you? Well, I don't know. We asked them to join us. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a major problem. The only problem is that even today, as we speak, m emails are being sent with transcript of records and all kinds of things to people, and there is nothing as unsafe as an email. So we have to be also be realistic about what is actually possible. It will take a while. If we, I mean, you can be so secure in your system that you can't do anything anymore. And that's the most secure system. You just shut it off, right? Okay. Identity management is very important. We've already heard also from Vanessa the various discussions that are going on about a, a unique identifier for all students in Europe. That would be a major uh, advantage. But also, uh, it's not so easy. Some servers require other identity management protocols and others and so on. So you can imagine how to know who is entitled to use the system and in which way are they going to log in and so on. That's relatively sounds easy again, but in practice it's not so easy. And then, of course, the f major item of the, uh, f of the pilot phase was to actually start building those connector modules those modules that make it possible for a server of one university to actually go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the university, sorry, to the uh, Erasmus Without Paper, and then exchange information. In technical jargon, this is called APIs, Advanced Programming Interface. Okay, what is this all about? Uh, some, uh, most of you will probably know about this anyway. It's real-time data exchange. That is important. It is on the fly. It happens while you are there. Uh, it's not the exchange of, of, of documents either. And for example, even though we will be flexible enough to allow for PDFs, uh, uh, a PDF in a way is also a paper version of something. It is data that you cannot do anything with. We want to talk, we are talking about machine read, readable data, data that can be, that you can do something with, right? And if you have access to the data, you can then turn it into uh, documents with your own logo or whatever, depending on what you want to do. Of course, the paper-based workflow has to be replaced by a digital one, that's obvious. And in this way, we hope to tackle the administrative workload for um, the staff 
in, in especially I, uh, international relations offices, but also for the students. Uh, you know the whole problem, uh, uh, the, uh, the film was made about it, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into that. But at one time we used that to, to, to see uh, or to show to people that it's important to do something about it. And all on top of it, it has to be, or it, it, we should also create free public infrastructure. In, in other words, this is an open network and we will also provide, or we are also providing uh, infrastructure that everyone can use. What, is the, the, what are the defining characteristics of EWP? Uh, uh, well, the ambition is to enable interoperability. Uh, in other words, people can work together and use the systems in over more than 2,000 in-house systems. So more than 2,000 universities, uh, which is more or less half, but they are the, the, often the bigger ones, have their own system. And this, these systems have to be able to connect to each other. And of course, there are many more universities also who are using either no system at all at the moment, or they're using what we now call a third-party solution, which is either a commercial solution or, for example, a national consortium that uh, de devises a system for, for one particular country. And of course, this has to be done uh, electronically and securely. All the steps of the management of the Erasmus Exchange plus Exchange have to be dealt with. Uh, and in fact, our ambition and our, we anticipate using it for outside the Erasmus Plus program as well. There is the Erasmus Plus program is just in a way the start, but it can be used for much more than that, and that's the whole idea. And in, of course, what is the scale? We want to have all the European charter holders um, in, in, uh, connected and grow into a common platform for basically all internationalization processes. And the timing, we've heard about that already, it needs to be fully operational, and with fully operational, we mean that uh, people are actually using it, and that more and more people are actually implementing uh, before the next Erasmus program, which will be in early 2021. We need more cooperation for all of this. This is uh, an obvious plea, but it is very important because the human and the IT uh, resources are scarce in higher education. Uh, we hear of a lot of institutions, especially individual universities with their own systems, that it is a big investment to change all of this, yeah, to make the system really international because that's what it is all about. And we, that's why we need international cooperation. Also, the, the second project has taken that into account. You will hear more about that by we are starting up um, um, an open source university alliance. You will he hear more about that. And we already have some submissions for that. And of course, it has to be standardized because, and that's in many ways the even more difficult because everyone basically loves their own system or at least they used to their own system and you know this famous quote about resistant to change, people don't like changes very much. They really want to go on because what we were doing was all right and now we have to change everything again. Of course, the project results need to be compatible with each other. In that sense, we also want to be like a reference for future projects who are dealing with ICT so that they take into account the platform from the very beginning. And of course, I already said that open source will help in the transition. So, what's the state of play at this moment? Well, you've heard it already. This launch conference is actually the beginning of something. It doesn't come at the end of the project either, it comes in the middle of it. And we did this on purpose to show that we, the network is now ready, now we have to fully uh, implement it, we have to make sure that everyone is going to be on board and we have to make it actually work. We launched the network, we launched the electronic network, but lots of its functionality still has to be developed because it depends on the individual universities, the individual providers. Now we will also move away to some extent from the technical part 
and go into the support, the human support. We will have a competence center. You will hear more about that. We will integrate external tools so that they become compatible. We will concentrate on attracting new users. Especially this competence center is extremely important because it will allow as many stakeholders as possible to deal uh, with, with the Erasmus Art paper. Not only from the point of view of um, what are we going to do with it, how do we implement technically, but also how do I convince the management? How do I provide arguments for everyone to make sure that Erasmus Without Paper is a success? And, and this is very important as well, student data portability, which is like the, the official term for the exchange of data, and digitalization, they will not stop in Europe. Already, Erasmus Without Paper is, is uh, very active in uh, the Groningen Declaration Network, which is like the global organization that takes care or that tries to unite all the people who have data with them uh, in, in the world. And later on today in the uh, afternoon, you will hear, for example, the view from China, also the view from the US. You will hear some of the voices outside Europe. So that's very important as well. What are the ultimate goals? Well, the whole idea about uh, Erasmus Rapp Papers is that it offers services. This also means that new services can be added at any time. New APA, APIs can be made even about scenarios that we are not aware of yet in a sense. Uh, and all, uh, it's like a buffet as well. You can, use, you can implement some of it to start with. You don't have to do it all from the very beginning. That's important. So there is flexibility, there is possibility of growing into using it. Uh, if, for example, you want to make sure that you, you can show and this is what we will do later on, we will show how it is actually working. Uh, if you want to show that, for example, the exchange of key data is, is, is possible, this can be set up relatively quickly and you can be part of a Rasmus Art paper, as it were, depending on how good your people are, the IT people are, uh, in, in one or two weeks, for example. So, Again, EWP doesn't operate in a vacuum. We have the online learning agreement. We've heard about it, which will be integrated. The Agricons grade conversion uh, will also be included in, in, in the system. That will take another step because it means that people have to have their grading tables available as well, which is a, up till now a big problem to make people, to, make, to ensure that people actually have this information in place. Uh, MREX, we are we have been negotiating or we have been talking to the EMREX people last week and uh, I think it is safe to say that we will come into close co collaboration with them. We have the Erasmus Plus app, we have the, uh, the virtual assistant, European virtual assistant, ESMO which is actually a project which is not part of education and culture but of uh, of the uh, DG Connect. So it is an IT project that is going to use our, uh, our, pro uh, our network for its own purposes. This already proves that Erasmus Without Paper is more than just about Erasmus Plus. The mobility tool, this is a major achievement uh, and you will hear about that later as well. We will be able to make your life much easier in conversing, in exchanging data with the mobility tool. Of course, we have to also consider the European um, uh, unique identifiers, ADAS and so on. Uh, Vanessa has already referred to the My Academic ID project which is, in, which is being uh, launched now and which will deal to some extent about that. So from various angles, things are happening which will together grow into uh, something which could be a, a common platform. Whether it will still be called Erasmus without paper in the end or not, doesn't really matter. The problem, the advantage is that we are going to try and solve uh, the issues that we've had for a while. So the rollout, the documentation and the training modules will be ready from 2019, will be produced from 2019 and of course we want as many people to take part in the process so we can learn also from the problems that they have because you can imagine so many institutions with all their own identity, with all their own problems, we will 
actually set up an, a frequently asked question system which will allow you to, to um, which will allow everyone to read how can we do it. Because the challenge will be we don't have an organization of 300 people who will take care of it, of it all. It has to be very lean. It has to be very efficient. We have to make sure that we can leave as much of the implementation of the problems with the users themselves and for that we need to provide all the relevant information. And of course, I said it as well, the data do not be the, uh, restricted to exchange data so it can be much more than just Erasmus. Plus, EWP is shifting its focus. It is more and more thinking about reusing, recycling. Uh, I told you already it is going to be an umbrella for existing open source tools. Uh, you see some of them there. Uh, and we have launched the Open Source University Alliance. Uh, you will hear about that more. So, in order to do that, we need more impact. We need more sustainability. We have to make sure that this is something that doesn't stop at the end of the project, but that will be there for as long as I can remember, hopefully. Huh? Uh, and we have to make sure that this fragmentation is going to end. A lot of projects are there, they have excellent results, and then because there is no real sustainability after one or two years, everyone forgets about them. Um, and I, I have done some of these projects myself, so I know about it. What's the ultimate dream? And but Vanessa knows that, but that's our dream. We want to be at the electronic brain of the new Erasmus Plus program. Uh, and with your help, we can make this happen. On top of that, we are trying to anticipate how the workflows themselves can be adapted. How we can take advantage of a new infrastructure. Because at the moment, and this is something which sounds very complicated to some, but at the moment what we are doing is basically we are churning, which is a paper-based concept, into a digital concept. But the concept itself is still paper-based. It is based on a logical con a sequence of what essentially starts with uh, something that you do on paper. Once we have the full div digital infrastructure, we can perhaps think of completely new ways of doing things. Of course, this will not happen immediately. This will be probably uh, the next uh, Erasmus Plus program. But it's important to know that people are already thinking about that. How can we simplify? How can we make it much more powerful by using digital tools, not only to replace work-based processes, but to create new ones? And that's, I think it's an important message as well. Who are the ta target stakeholders? They are the kind of people who are here as well. Of course, the IRO people. They are in many institutions the people who will deal with it most, they have to monitor the developments, they have to help define a digital strategy within their own institutions as well. Because it is now time to start dealing with it. Eh? To make sure that, because IT development is something which starts off very slowly, so now is the time to join it because otherwise uh, it will be difficult to reach this in your individual universities, it will be difficult to reach the, the, the deadline of the beginning of the next program. The university leadership will have to be aware of the challenges and will have to make new policy decisions. Right? Because very often people say, okay, when it's there, we will do our share. Okay, we wait as long as possible because otherwise we don't know what's exactly, what exactly is going on. Also, the university leadership will have to do its part. And that's why we will, in the competence center, we will also provide for uh, people and, and, and modules that will help convince and show university leadership that it is important to change this, that it is an important idea. Everyone, and this is not a given in the past, everyone now accepts internationalization as, as uh, important. When I started, that was not the case. You had to fight for internationalization. You had to fight for uh, exchange students. Now everyone has accepted it. It's part of the general policy of almost all universities. This is the next step. 
digitalization of internationalization, doing this not only on a local level, not even on a national level, but on a European level and even a global level. That's important. And that's important too. The IT teams have to become international. Very often we have very local solutions to problems and they say, okay, they have never anticipated that this is something that, that they need to do uh, on an international basis. And then you get all kinds of new problems. This is the kind of things we have come across and we will be coming across them, but I would like to send out this message. What are the types of mobility so software in use? M many of you have seen it, but I've, I've got a, a, a new graphic now. Uh, so the majority of people actually have no specific tools at all. So that's an important message. The rest is uh, divided between uh, developed in-house developed uh, student information systems and commercial or third-party tools. Yeah? Um, so it is important to, re to, to, to see that, this, that we have like three major types of users. And which type of user is your higher education institution? We have this nice uh, sort of tree of, 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 of questions. Huh? If you have your own in-house uh, in system, you are, if, you have, if the answer is yes, then you have to implement the APIs by your own ICT team. Or you have to come together with a number of universities or whatever to make this happen. This or it, or in itself is a major thing. If you have no in-house system, either you have a third tool, a uh, third um, party tool, which could be either commercial or uh, a national uh, consortium, for example, and hopefully and normally, but they are completely separate target group, they will integrate this in their software. Luckily, in our project, we have several of these users as well, and you will see, uh, I think it is very symbolic that both, for example, Move On and SOP are part of this project and they will be able to exchange information with each other. I think that's a major development and it's important. And not only those, we have a lot of interest from other ones. Uh, Osiris in, in, uh, in, in Holland is here. Um, Teradota, the American system, is here. We have uh, Solenove, many others are interested. Okay, we are still in the early stages, but of course this increases the number of high, higher education institutes um, that are going to use this exponentially. And if you have nothing at the moment, then you can still fall back to the external tools that are integrated in Erasmus Our Paper. At the moment, we have the online learning agreement there is um, the virtual assistant that is coming, uh, the international uh, agreement, international in, I, 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 the inter in, instit international institutional <laughs> agreement. There are so many, uh, so many um, abbreviations. Anyway, okay. So that's the whole idea that you all belong somewhere. And of course, you could shift from one to another, but it's important to decide what is the future going to be for us. The whole message is no university will be left behind. In principle, everyone should be able to, to use something. Everyone can be part of Erasmus Health Paper. And that's a very important message, I think. And from our point of view, Erasmus Health Paper is also here to stay. We are in constant touch, not only with DG AAC, Education and Culture, but also with DG Connect, the IT part of um, of uh, the European uh, Commission, and we are working together. We are, this My Academic Identity is not a project of education and culture, it's a project of DG Connect. So that's important to see that these things lead to synergies and cooperation at all levels, from the lowest to the highest. And I think we, we didn't anticipate this as such, but I think this is one of the major achievements of the community behind Erasmus our paper as well. We have presented our vision to, uh, already at, to about 18 national agencies all over Europe. So because the national agencies are also going to be crucial in helping this. Uh, because universities on their own will not always be able to, to deal with this or to, 
to understand it fully or to know what they have to do. The national agencies are, as it were, the natural place where these universities per country can come together. We have been in almost every important conference that you can imagine, the EAIE in Geneva, for example. We even had a booth there. Uh, we were at Eracon. Uh, we, are, we were at UNIS, which is a more technical uh, uh, conference. The, uh, the EUF organized the Erasmus Going Digital Conferences. We have been in the Groningen Declaration Network that was in Paris this year. Next year it will be in Mexico. And so we have been to various places. And so far, and this is increasing all the time, the reception is overwhelming. That is because there is a real need. But of course... From today onwards, this need has to be changed into actual accomplishments, into actual solutions, and that's important. More and more commercial and third-party softwares are contacted us about implementation. Uh, this means that we also have to have rules for that. How do you do this? This is something which is not so easy. How do, what do you engage yourself if you use Erasmus R paper? How do we protect the quality of our label, Erasmus R paper? These are things that, in a way, when you start a project, you say, oh, yes, we will deal with that later. But we are dealing with it now, and it, is, it leads to very serious discussions. That's important. And, of course, we follow the global developments uh, very closely. So this is one like the slogans of EWP now. Digital change is cultural change. It is not so much, or it is not only about technology, it is about people using the technology. In a way, to exaggerate a little bit, de developing technology is easy, but helping users to make the most of it, that's the challenge. And this is something personally that I have believed in from the very, very beginning. Those at the University of uh, of uh, Ghent University who have followed my career. Notice this from the very beginning I've said, always said ICT should be at the service of the user and not vice versa. Uh, I've not always been successful in this but on the whole I think we have been making major strides towards that. That's important. That's the message and I would like to thank you for your attention for that. Thank you. We are slightly behind schedule, but not much. Uh, so now we're supposed to have coffee so that they can set up everything for the actual launch. Uh, so we expect you back no later than in half an hour, okay? So 11 o'clock sharp, we start with the launch itself. Be ready. <laughs>
This is a very solemn moment, eh? and that's why I've asked Zhao to join me as well, because as you know, or may not know, that now the European University Foundation is the coordinating institution of the project. I am the coordinator, which is as a way, in a way, just a, an He's the boss. No, no. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. He is the <laughs> boss and I do what he tells me. <laughs> but uh, that's why I think it is fitting that the two of us uh, launch this uh, project. And uh, um, we have all the teams here, technical teams and people who were going, who will, going to present the situation. And uh, so I must say I'm, I'm even a little bit moved, which doesn't happen very often in these circumstances, uh, that we can finally, because I haven't actually seen it in this detail myself yet, so I'm in a way, in some ways, even though I know exactly what's going to happen, uh, I hope that it will happen like that anyway. <laughs> Okay, so Joe, perhaps you can say something? Yes, I just wanted to say two things, which is, um, I think one of the very special aspects of Erasmus Without Piper is that it's an initiative by universities for universities. And this is a very different approach than just sitting in the corner complaining and waiting for someone to solve the problems for us. I think if we want to have a voice, if we want to shape the way Erasmus, student mobility and our daily work happens, this is the ideal way to engage. And I just wanted to say that um, all of this wouldn't have been possible without um, immense dedication from some colleagues. I, there are two colleagues in particular I'd like to highlight. Valer is of no surprise because he's been a cornerstone of the project since its earliest days. But also Janine, who is our technical leader, and maybe you can yes. stand up for a split second, um, who has taken an immense burden upon herself. Um, the truth is that the team is much bigger than just the three of us. So I just wanted to ask all the colleagues from the team, from the EWP team, to stand for a second so that we can give you a round of applause if you agree to join me on that. Yes. Yes, it has been wonderful to work together with all these people. Uh, not always very easy, but always very interesting. We, uh, I think uh, we should also thank uh, Anthony, who is an external evaluator, uh, and uh, from the very beginning, the, the person who not only has evaluated us, but given us a lot of ideas, sometimes very critical, uh, but I like that personally, because at least then you come to the truth much more quickly. Uh, but it's important that we have people like that, dedicated people, people who know what they're doing. And for the, I think for the, for the very first time, we have been able to bring together what is essentially local teams into an international team that has had to solve uh, the issues. So without further ado, I would say I would like Paul to start with the launch and to really make this thing happen. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So we, we, we already had the applause for the launch of the network and we hadn't done anything yet. That's interesting. Um, the idea about the actual launch, so EWP is a network. In, in theory, that's easy. Uh, but of course, there's five or six colleagues sitting over here. They are, are, are the brains at our universities, at our system, to make their system connect to the network. And that's less easy, I might say. And, and the idea of this actual lounge session is, we approach it as a session from IROs to IROs. So there won't be a, a, an extensive technical explanation about the network, it will come later in the conference program. What, what we will try to do here is stories from IROs about the current problems, challenges they face in terms of administrating the Erasmus program, and I'm sure that will work. They will tell the story as it is now. And then we will try to, to show how Erasmus Without Paper 
can cater for solutions on the problems our IRO uh, people uh, face. And I will introduce the IROs one by one because they're all involved in one or, or two scenarios. And, and for the first scenario, I want to ask uh, Imina on stage from uh, Université Paris-Est Marne Valley. There's a mic over here. Um, there, you can use that. And, and um, Imina, uh, her institution is using MoveOn. Uh, some of you are also using MoveOn, I know. It's, it's a, a, a company that developed specific software for managing mobilities. And our colleague Umesh from MoveOn will, do the, will, will support us with the demo. Um, and, and they represent 300 clients. So, Université Marne le, le, Est Le Paris, Paris Est La, Le Marne, sorry. It's Paris a difficult name. Yeah, that one. For you, it's easy. For me, it's difficult. Um, so, so, they are just one of the clients, which means that each, uh, each uh, IRO in the room using MoveOn has the same functionality that we show here. And of course, this also counts for, for some others that I will introduce later. For example, Mobility Online. It's a system from uh, SOP, also a, a mobility software package. And Georg, will, 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 he's the technical guy who will support us in the demo. Um, and, and they also have this dedicated software for managing mobility, and they represent about 200 clients. So in the exchange that we will see now on the screen, we already have 500 institutions covered by the network, which, which is an, on itself already a nice uh, achievement. Um, without further ado, I will, I will ask uh, Imina to, to tell her story about uh, what happens with contacts and addresses of universities uh, in, in, inside your system. Okay, so currently when creating a new cooperation, I add uh, manually the contact information and other relevant uh, institutional data that I need for my uh, daily use. Uh, and then I try to keep uh, the contact information up to date when the uh, partner institution informs us about the contact person changes and so on. But it's challenging because um, uh, and there's, um, well, as, as you know, there's a quite high turnover, um, turnover in the international offices and not always the partner institutions are informed. Uh, so when I uh, send a collective email, uh, I um, basically always receive a dozen of uh, automatic messages uh, telling me that my email could not be delivered because uh, this email address does not exist anymore. Uh, so then I have no choice but going to the uh, partner's website and trying to look for the uh, new contact information. And moreover, um, many, many institutions uh, don't have a, a good quality data uh, what comes to the um, uh, faculties or departments. So if uh, you look for uh, more information about the um, uh, structure of the institution or uh, about the contact details uh, at the um, faculty level. So now um, to demonstrate how, to, how uh, Erasmus Vital Paper can help us to access up-to-date uh, data information. Uh, let's say I would like to know, uh, I would like to find out information on the University of Bremen. So in Move On, I look for University of Bremen in, uh, in our inst uh, external institutions. And uh, well, I know this that as I haven't added anything manually, I have not so much information. I have the name of the university, Erasmus code, and, um, and basically that's it. But then um, uh, we link uh, Bremen to, uh, with the uh, Erasmus without paper uh, API connection. And so we, uh, on this other window, we, ha and we see what uh, Bremen has um, uh, written on their own session as their own information. So uh, we, we can be sure that it's Bremen that has um, uh, informed, um, that has 
entered this information, so we can suppose that if they keep it up to date, it's, uh, it's perfect. And then if, and uh, here we have information about the uh, faculties uh, and so. And then what happens if uh, there's somebody who, who leaves, so if there are changes in the staff, I think it's time to switch to the other system that is used by the University of Bremen, which I refer to Mobility Online, to add some contact and see what happens. Because it takes some time, Georg is now creating a new contact affiliated to the IRO. We can affiliate it to many uh, departments, of course, but now we, we we, we will do it for the IRO. This is the local implementation of Mobility Online. Each and every university has, has some system, maybe not, uh, but at least those that, has a, that have a system can create contacts, they can change things, so you do it internally. So it's created here, test EWP. Is it connected to in the international office, Georg? just to make sure we don't need to, to look for it in many different organizational units. These guys are, are wizards with computers, you know? We can't follow what they're doing, <laughs> but it, it's happening. Okay. So now it's over there. We can switch back to move on. So, if I refresh my session, uh, we, we, we need to have some time. This is <laughs> Wi-Fi, you're probably all connected to either room. adds to the excitement in the room. <laughs> However. <laughs> so we're sure the person is connected to the IRO. This was about to happen, you know. We did it yesterday, it was perfect. How many IT guys in this room? <laughs> Raise hands. How many of you would dare to do a demo without any video recording or whatsoever? Raise hands. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's why. There should, should, things should go wrong once we, once we try it. And you know, um, at the launch of iPhone X, somebody knows the story? What happened when, when they tried to demonstrate the, the face recognition? It was like this, and nothing happened. Bit like this, if even Apple can, can have this kind of issues, it can happen to us as well. Maybe we, we, we should um, try once again. So we refresh once again. Okay, there it is. So now, as we have our um, contact information updated, uh, we, uh, we can send, uh, for example, our Christmas card, uh, cards to our partners and they won't get lost. Gent is connected to EWP. I accept a, a Christmas card in, in two weeks. So can I ask um, Mobility Online and Sigma to connect to um, the projector? because now I want to introduce uh, Matthias Buchen, who is working in the International Office of the University of Bremen. Um, and, and the University of Bremen, as I already explained, is using uh, the, the software from uh, SOP, Mobility Online, and they will exchange information with the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid in Spain. And this university is uh, using the Sigma system. And Sigma is also like a third-party software provider. They, they have an association of universities in Spain, about 20, 25 members. 
So all those members are connected to EWP via Sigma, and Carmen uh, is operating the system for, for this demo. Matthias, please tell us a story about inter-institutional agreements. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if you're um, familiar with the, uh, with the term Groundhog Day. Um, it's when you have this feeling like again, so like getting up in the morning or so. And there are quite a lot of them in the Erasmus program. And one of the really annoying ones is uh, every seven years, there's the ongoing or uh, upcoming thing about inter-institutional agreements. And it's not just one. Every seven years, there are hundreds of them. In a very short time frame, when the commission released the forms, uh, it's usually, let's say, if you're optimistic, three months before the beginning of the project. Um, and then we have to do, uh, the University of Bremen has, for example, about 700 of them. So we have to do 700 of these inter-institutional agreements. And the way it is done right now is paper. So they are agreed on. Ta technically, the really annoying part of that is it's just an ongoing cooperation anyway. So it's a pro forma thing, but we have to do it again every time. Um, it's agreed upon. Now it has to, every, everything has to go into writing. Everyone has to sign it. It will be scanned, sent to another one by email. There will be printed, and signed again, scanned again, and so on. So there are a lot of trees and bits and bytes wasted in the process. And also we have to enter them into our database because otherwise our students can't use them. Uh, that's actually done pretty early in the process. So sometimes even when they are not signed, or, because it's, for us it's a sort of pro forma thing, not for the commission, I know, uh, but uh, so that we can at least start using them. So, and sometimes we discover that there are some agreements lost in the process, but the, the exchange goes on anyway. And um, yeah, it's actually, it, it works, but it's not a very nice process. And we have really big hopes into the Erasmus with a paper uh, project uh, because this will mean that we can do everything online without having to print, sign, stuff like that. So um, the, the scenario we developed is that the Universität Carlos III has sent us uh, an agreement which shows up when we go into our uh, EWP system. And there it is, the bottommost one. We just have to click on the plus to, to take it into our system. Uh, just have a quick look at that. Um, okay, Spain is a very popular country for our students, so that's not enough what we have there, so let's put 20 in there. <laughs> okay, and we set the data set active, means we accepting the agreement in this changed way. And by taking that into our system, the University Carlos will receive a message about the changed data, which will show up in their system, hopefully. Once again, it's not, not only the network, it's of course Wi-Fi. We're dependent on Wi-Fi. The system works better if you connect it via wired at your office, of course, but you're all looking at the live stream or taking pictures and sending it to your home university. That's why it's sometimes a bit slow. But in the end, we're getting there. So now... And as you can see, the changed uh, numbers show up. So it's up to uh, the University of Carlos to accept these numbers, which they are nice, they do it. And um, yeah, basically the process is done with that. However, that also, the whole thing also needs a sort of cultural change. We also already heard, heard about that one on the part of the European Commission, because right now technically we have to still print it and have it signed manually. So we, they just have to accept it it's in the system, it's documented, it's transparent when it was agreed on, upon by, by all the partners, 
uh, everyone can see it, and it's documented onto the second when it was signed or agreed. Uh, so the signatures is actually just to satisfy the human eye. It doesn't really have any meaning anymore. I mean, we all do shopping online. So we do it by logging in and expressing our will to, to spend the money. So uh, that's something we have to adopt for this process as well, because otherwise it's sort of a half progress, I would say. But as you can see, it works. So how does that sound for the thousands of agreements that will sign amongst all of us in the room in the coming months, I guess, because we need to pre be prepared for the next program? Our, our next scenario, and I ask uh, Bavo and Francesco, they are already connecting to the, the, the projector. Um, and, and Bavo and Francesco, they all represent an individual institution. Bavo is working just like myself for Ghent University. Uh, Francesco is working for the University of Porto. And uh, so both, both universities um, have their own uh, in-house system where mobility is part of the student information system. So in our case, we need to build the connector ourselves. Those clients from MoveOn, from, from, from uh, Mobility Online, from Sigma, they have an easy life. They can just use the software and connect. For us, it's less easy. We need to build the APIs from scratch in order to connect all system to the network, to communicate with all move on clients with all SOP clients, but also amongst elves. And the next, um, the next uh, scenario is about nominations. Anybody in this room deals with nominations? I want to comment on the current processes, practices. Yeah, please speak out loud. It's complicated, okay. That's already a very good start. I, I, for Ghent, we have about 500 Erasmus agreements. I can testify we have a separate database. This university, that faculty, this person needs to be nominated that way. So, and then we have those institutions where need, we need to log in into a system and nominate the students inside the system of the university. And then we have yet another one where we can just send an email or an Excel, uh, an Excel sheet with those column headers. Complicated, exactly. And I think it's very clear that with Erasmus without paper, you can connect your systems. Um, that with Erasmus without paper, there's, there's some efficiency gains, I would say. Uh, first, let's look into uh, Oasis. Um, so, Bavo, yeah. Um, there are uh, four students. Uh, we anonymize them by putting the name of EWP family name. So there's uh, Arthur, Robin, Cedric, and Tim. And they are already inside our system, uh, entitled to go on the mobility towards Porto. The only thing we need to do now is go to our database and look how do we need to nominate students to Porto. Of course, with EWP, we don't need to do that anymore. But I first want to show you, so we have... Uh, Arthur, Robin, Cedric, and Tim. Um, let's um, first get into the port. System, if those students already exist, because of course we can do it beforehand, no problem, no live demo. So I will uh, nominate Arthur later on. So as Arthur already part of the incoming mobilities at the University of Porto. We cooperate quite a lot, so there will be many students. Maybe one Arthur, but maybe not this one. Let's see. Do we have an Arthur, Francisco? Okay. No Arthur. So let's get back to Oasis and nominate the student, which is a very easy thing. We just click the box. <laughs> Done. Easy. Now let's see if it works. We go back to the portal system.
And there, on top of the, of the screen, we, uh, Porto has notifications. If we go to notifications, there's an incoming mobility. Can you check this mobility? It's from Ghent University. That's no problem, because this no notification was not sent at 4 a.m. in the morning, of course. We just, the computer notified Porto during the night in order to, to have some extra uh, space for service during the day. Um, but, but if we go to the institution, because this is a very easy way. You get a notification, you go to nominations, and you have a complete overview of newly nominated students. Of course, the students also uh, ticked the box. And I think it's clear that with this kind of procedures, nomination process is super easy. And I think the common it's complicated. For the next demonstration, and it's all going well so far, thank you, technical team. Could all of us have developed API, so all of it could be in one or, 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 or another scenario. Um, but that would take too much time, and the clear message is there, I think. Uh, so now we have um, uh, SOP connected, Mobility Online, and Warsaw. And, and the University of Warsaw runs a, a system that is used by the majority of Polish higher education institutions in Poland. So they have a consortium of universities, and, uh, which is named MUCI, and Warsaw is, is, is the institution that developed the API and offers it to all MUCI users, which also means we have 200 about 60 universities in Poland connected with this scenario. Um, and I want to ask Eva and uh, Matthias, another time, uh, to come on stage for this scenario. Hello. He comes to our office to sign the financial agreement, the most important aspect of the mobility for the student and for us alike. The most important thing about calculating the amount of the grant is the date. The arrival date and the departure date from the host university. These dates are estimates. At the beginning, we don't know what the mobility period will be. The student might only estimate it. Great, his courses are great. Uh, and at the end of his study period, he gets a message from me. Uh, please remember to submit your confirmation of stay if you'd like to uh, receive the remaining part of your grant. In order to do so, Mark, being uh, a diligent student, he has to download a document from our website. He needs to find a printer to print it. Then he needs to fill it in, uh, checking his dates, and he needs to bring it to Bremen International Relations Office for a signature and a stamp. And then he needs to find a scanner or, if he has a good phone, send it to me. I receive the email. I'm lucky if everything is correct in the dates. But as you know, there are lots of students who get their dates wrong. There are a lot of documents which might be um, signed with the wrong date or there is a stamp missing or something goes wrong with the document. There would be no problem if Mark was the only student. However, there are about 1,000 students going every year from the University of Warsaw. Erasmus only, and I bet, I won't be mistaken if I say that the summertime is the time that people like me dread, is the time when we receive virtually hundreds of emails with attachments, 
and it's the time when all of them come at the same time, but sometimes we don't get them and we are waiting for them because students simply fail to submit their documents and we don't know what the study period is um, for the particular student. And we need these dates in order to go ahead with our financial aspects. So I think to, to me personally, this time of year, at the end of the semester, at the end of the academic year, it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, and um, what about you? Do you, is it, do you find it a burdensome as well? It's definitely a burden. I wouldn't go to nightmare, but um, yeah. <laughs> but actually, the University of Warsaw is one of the easy universities because quite a lot of the others also require a confirmation of arrivals. So we have to do it twice at the beginning and at the end of this day. Um, usually students also are not quite sure if there are documents from their university or if they, the university accepts uh, documents from our side. So sometimes we have to do it twice, we give them ours and then they come back and, oh, I need from my university. Um, yeah, it's, it's a life. So we have a sort of welcome desk uh, where we welcome all the guest students at the beginning. We do all the administrative stuff, we, we organize them with their activities. Uh, they get the semester documents and we also record their date of arrival at that time because sometimes they even come weeks later with the uh, confirmation of arrival and otherwise we wouldn't be able to, to put the proper date in there. So and we do that in mobility online. Well, we have a, it's called pipeline step, it's just a language of, of SAP, uh, uh, to, to just uh, record the, the arrival. And in this case, we agreed on Marek Kanarek, who is the student from Warsaw. So we just basically tick it, click it, and then the arrival date is set for that date because when they are standing in front of us, they are actually there. We, we can cert certify that. And now, the University of Warsaw will receive a notification that that student arrived. They don't need it, but it's just possible doing that by EWP. And as you can see, he arrived at our university. So technically for universities who require that, they can now give him the money he needs for this day at, in Bremen. And for the University of Warsaw, they just need the confirmation of stay. But still, it's good to know that the student arrived at the host institution. <laughs> So uh, we have another pipeline step for at the end of their stay, where we then just confirm that they left the university or the, basically we usually fill that step when they present the confirmation of stay, when we have to fill that in, then we also put the date in there. And with EWP, it's just one click again and the uh, sending university will receive the date of when the student left the University of Bremen. And let's see, now that's the moment I am waiting for. We're waiting for the okay, actual... University of Bremen is very fast. So. <laughs> right now we're just waiting for the actual date of return. Will it appear in our system? As I'm sitting at my desk, instead of getting an email with an attachment, will I get it? Is it in the system? Let's see. actual date of return, I can see it, we click, we fetch the date, we have it in our system, do we? Yes, we do, the actual date yes. of return, the actual date of uh, departure. They're both in the system. Yes. 
So for the receiving university, there is no need to sign anything anymore or stamp anything anymore because these are actually dates sent by the receiving university, so it's secure, it's confirmed by the institution. There's nothing the student can do about that. So this is actually dates where you can base the funding on. And for the um, sending institution, we have the dates in the system, we can calculate the grant, and if uh, your national agency insists on having the document printed, which I know is the case in some, um, some countries, there is always a possibility of printing the document with the dates, with the uh, right of, um, authentication from the system. Yeah. So we can produce a document if it is needed, but the most important thing is that we have it in the system. So. And a sort of real-time reliable. There's a need for change at the universities, but there's clearly a need for change at the national agency level, of course. And that's why we are very happy that there's many national agencies present here today and that we have the European Commission backing us up that this kind of things is like the way they want us to do things. Our final scenario is about uh, Warsaw and Porto. We, they have been introduced already, but I haven't introduced my colleagues from Warsaw and Por Porto. Barbara and Clementina will tell you something about transcript of records. So as most of you are probably working with mobilities, you know that uh, after the dates are one important thing, but probably the most important document for the student and for the host university as well is the transcript of records. We want to know what the student did uh, while on exchange. So at the end of the semester, every international office is quite busy producing transcripts. Uh, we produce hundreds of transcripts. We have to print them from our system. Um, we have to then deliver them to the student and to the university. Currently, we're sending a PDF to the student. And as Valer said, uh, email is the most unsafe mode of communication. So unfortunately, we're still doing that. And uh, most of the universities we work with, or a lot of them, require to have the original transcript with the stamp, the signature. So then we spend um, days or even weeks uh, putting transcripts into envelopes, sending them around, wasting a lot of time, and also relying on the postal services, which are sometimes not so reliable. So our um, partners in Porto are anxiously waiting for the transcripts, and we are busy preparing them. And this could be made a little bit easier. Uh, we have the pleasure of hosting several students from Porto every year, and this year, we have a student called Diego. Diego was very happy in Warsaw, we hope. He was very busy uh, working uh, in his courses. At the end of his stay, he's finally ready to receive the transcript. So he asks me for the transcript. I go into our system, to USOS. I generate the transcript, and I produce a beautiful PDF. Uh, I download the PDF so you can see uh, Diego's achievements on screen. So this is what Diego did in Warsaw. Usually I'll print the doc uh, now I would print the document, send him the document, but I don't want to do this anymore. I want Barbara in Porto to have the document instantly. And of course I know she's receiving a lot of emails, so I'm not sending her an email telling her that there's a transcript ready. I'm sending a notification in the system. After I um, produce the document, I just do, um, send her the notifi notification and she gets information in her system. So now it's time for us to check out our internal system and you can see notifications there. I have two new notifications. I have one incoming mobility. I'm sure it's the one from Paul before. <laughs> well, we can check it just to make sure it is. There you go. Uh, so it, it actually works. It might take a little bit more time because of the network and, and connection, uh, but it works. Let's go into the transcript of records, which is what we want to present now. So look at there. We have check transcript of records. So we know when, when uh, the transcript of records arrived from Warsaw. Thank you for saving one more email. Let's have a look at it. You see, every um, single information is already in my system, just with a click of a button. So instead of receiving 
more than 1,000, and I'm only talking about Erasmus outgoing students out of the 2,800 we, we send, well, out of, out of the 1,400. 1, more than 1,000 are Erasmus. So if we can relieve the international office and the academic services of this burden, because it is a very time-consuming process, isn't it? Who here works at the international office? Uh, the great majority. So you know what I'm talking about, right? When we receive the transcript of records, then we have to put all the information, all the data by hand in our internal system so that we can go ahead with the academic recognition. And this is really a time-consuming process, especially when we have so many students, as Warsaw also has. So here we have all the information already in our system. But for those who really love PDFs, we also have a PDF there. Francisco, can you please show the PDF we have? And we can even check our PDF with the, the there you go, view PDF, please. And we can even check our PDF together with Warsaw's PDF so that you can confirm that it's exactly the same information, it's exactly the same document, and with a click of a button and just a few seconds, Porto has the information already in our, uh, inside the system and we can move ahead with the, with the recognition process. We know that this, um, at the moment, this is a challenge. In the worst case scenario, as we were commenting yesterday, students sometimes get delays. Uh, for instance, they cannot graduate just because they are still waiting either for the transcript to be sent or for the recognition to uh, be uh, uh, done by the home university. Through this system, the, the, through the click of a button, then it will be far, far easier. But we also have an additional um, information that this morning was already presented and it will be presented later on that will also ease the academic recognition process, which is great conversion. So it's nice when we have the information from Warsaw, but then we need also to develop and we are working on this. So these are very good news. We are already working on the great conversion system and platform that will assist and ease the process of academic recognition. So overall, we might say that through Erasmus Without Paper Network, we can um, increase uh, the degree of accuracy, the, uh, the quality of the information, the transparency in, in all the process. You can audit all the process, and also it makes the process faster. And we can even speed it up further because as you saw, we have Diego who was from Porto visiting Warsaw for a semester, but he was not alone. He had friends. Uh, I believe there were eight of them in the same semester. And thanks to EWP, uh, we can send the eight transcript all at one go, not just the PDFs, but the yeah. data as well. So they can have data, uh, the results for each course for each one of the eight students at one click of a button. Uh, and then start the recognition process for all of them at the same time. So it's making things even faster. Yeah. It puts a smile on our face, honestly. <laughs> because we can see the impact at the international office. Thank you. Thank you for, for those scenarios and thank you to the technical team who, who made this happen. It was probably the most stressful session of today. This one is done, almost. First of all, I, I would probably those in the IRO recognize the process, right? We need some informational institutions, we can build an agreement, we nominate students. Something happened there, there's, there's a learning agreement, right? We didn't talk about the learning agreement. It's because we are also organizing a final conference and we, of course, want to have some audience there. If we now show you everything, there's, there's no, you, you, you won't come to our final conference. And it's also because we will, we will work a lot on learning agreements in the year to come, 2019. It will be on top of our agenda uh, because some of you might know OLA, the online learning agreement, which is at the moment a standalone tool where you can uh, completely 
make learning agreements online. Now, of course, the idea is to integrate OLA with the Erasmus Web paper, and that's one of the things we're planning in 2019. And there's also another thing that we still want to do in 2019, but I pass the floor to Harpa, who will uh, tell you uh, something about that. She works at the European Commission in the unit uh, from Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Yes, hi, my name is Harpa. I work in the Higher Education Unit, uh, B1. I uh, work with Vanessa, who presented here earlier today. Uh, there's no coincidence that I was chose to be on this stage, I think, to present uh, what we're going to be working on or what we have been working on with uh, the EWP partners and we'll be working on in the next year. And the reason is that I now work at the European Commission, but previously I was working at an international relations office of the University of Iceland for six years. So all of the problems that were described here, I know them all too well. Some of them I'd even forgotten about, so it made me even more excited about uh, this whole project. Um, so I'm very happy to be working with the uh, EWP partners and also we have now launched uh, working groups where we have national agencies, higher education institutions, student unions and all of the, the project partners of EWP working together with us to make sure that we have an Erasmus program that really supports this kind of innovation, that everything works together coherently. Also, I have very selfish motivations for this because I intend to go then back and work for the University of Iceland. So I'm one of the people who will benefit from all of this. So rest assured that within the commission, uh, we fully understand what needs to happen. And we are very happy to be working uh, with EWP. Now, what we've been working on uh, in this past year is establishing a connection between the network that has been demonstrated here today and the Mobility Tool Plus. And I'm one of the people who was working in an international relations office when Mobility Tool was launched. So I understand that this was a complete duplication of the processes that had been taking place in the months prior to the start of the project. The nomination process usually is taking place before, well, at the very start, um, early start of the year, the early months of the year, then application process happens. And usually when you know who is actually going to go on Mobility, all of those uh, steps have taken place, then you need to encode the students in the mobility tool. And there you would just have to, well, first, I never was able to import directly from Excel, so I'm one of those people who did everything manually. So a lot of my time was actually wasted on, on encoding things in mobility tool, with, which did not, well, it has a lot of value for statistical purposes and an overview of the grant management, but in terms of actually facilitating the student mobility it doesn't it, it's just an extra layer so we want to fix this and what we have now done is that we are in the process of finalizing the first links between the EWP network and the mobility tool plus um, in the coming days we will have this link uh, up and running uh, Janina is gonna show you on the screen uh, how, concretely how it works I think we should maybe start by explaining what you can do now, and then I will grab the mic again and explain what we would like to do then um, in the future. Uh, Paul, would you uh, narrate for us? Or Janina, you will narrate? I, I will. Thank you. I hope it works. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, let's uh, have a look again uh, into the system. Uh, well, let's uh, assume for a while that I'm trying, that I'm interested in getting some institutional data from one of my partners, uh, University of Ghent. You have already heard, and Baba represents the, the University of Ghent, and you know that they support EWP, so I can get institutional data straight from uh, Ghent if I'm interested in. However, uh, it may happen that, for example, I want to get the data from some other partner. This, in this case, this is University of Helsinki. I try to get the data from the institution, uh, and I, I'm informed that not sorry, uh, University of Helsinki is not yet the partner of the EWP network. So what can I do? I still try, can try to get the data from the other source, very good one. Uh, I can uh, try to get the data from the mobility tool. And, uh, well, uh, they do not store that much data as you might find in the uh, university database. 
uh, in the local system. However, still something. For example, well, now I see that in my system, I, I, uh, the data has not been entered correctly because, as you see, the name in English is University of Helsinki. However, the name in the national language is uh, a different one. Uh, but okay, uh, I, will, I, I will copy the proper name. Sometimes it's, uh, for us it is difficult, especially when you have those national um, letters, so uh, special alphabet. But, uh, well, okay, I can uh, copy Helsingin Eliopisto. Uh, what else? I, I can copy Erasmus code. It was missing in my database. I, I could copy uh, post code. Uh, well, I could also copy uh, the, the other part of the address, the street and the... That's, uh, uh, this, for some reasons, it is not um, possible automatically, so I have to do it by hand. And uh, I save it, and that's it. I have it in my database. So this is one of the possible uh, sources of... The, this is one of the piece of data a mobility tool delivers to the public. The other possibility is... Uh, let's go to the University of Warsaw. I, watch, I have a special tab here called Mobility Tool, which is used by IRO for, um, for preparing reports for the Mobility Tool. Uh, what I uh, could uh, do now, I could uh, uh, get from the Mobility Tool information about the projects I have. As I remember, in 2015, we had two projects. Uh, in 2016, we had one project. And that's it. I can just get the codes, th those old, uh, those long project IDs and uh, store it in my local system. Uh, this is not yet all. Uh, to report the data to the mobility tool, you need a lot of dictionaries. You have to agree about some common data. And that common dictionaries, uh, well, uh, it's fine if they are up to date, but they may change. So from time to time, you have to synchronize your local version with the version uh, uh, which is official one, and uh, uh, you can get this official one anytime straight from the mobility tool, and then synchronize uh, uh, what you have in your system uh, with uh, what you are getting uh, from the mobility tool plus. That's it. Any, any dictionary which is needed to report the data correctly, you can just get with a click. Thank you, Janina. So this is, let's say, phase one of the project of linking the EWP with the Mobility Tool Plus. The next step and what will happen next year is that with the click of a button from the EWP network, you can import all of the student data directly into the Mobility Tool. So there's no need, again, one thing that I learned when I started working with these guys is that there is a principle called the once only principle, genius idea, because if you've entered data once into a system, you shouldn't have to do it again and again. And the commission really very much wants to facilitate this once only process. So the mobility tool comes into play somewhere in the middle of the process. So this is what we will do. From call 2019 on, at the start of the academic year 2019, all of you who are in the EWP network will be able to do this directly from the nomination system into the mobility tool, but only if you're in the network. So I really encourage you to start today to start testing the functionalities, become a partner, and uh, be with us in the digital revolution. And I also want to say this, that once we have this connection and this feature incorporated with the, in the links between EWP and the mobility tool, then the commission is completely open to exploring other things that we could incorporate so that we could make the lives of international relations officers easier. More communication connection between the system to facilitate a very efficient and integrated workflow from start to finish. So we are in full agreement with the statements that have been made today and look forward to the years ahead uh, to development. So please join us in the testing phase and help us with this. Thank you. I, I think many of you heard about Erasmus Work paper. There have been many conferences, but I don't think it ever became this concrete. And I hope now for you, it's, it's, you, you have a better idea how it works, the processes we support, and, and, of course, some of you 
are already part of the network without even knowing it, others will need to start developing. And with this launch of the network, it's open for each and every institution. And we will come back to how this works in a session tomorrow. I think it's appropriate to give those IT visits and those IRO colleagues another round of applause for this great session. Thank you. And I pass the floor to Stefan, Daiga, and George. I don't know the exact order. No, just a second. Just, uh, I'll just check it. Yep, I'll, I'll connect it. You're starting, right? Yes, so I'm starting. In the back. Hi, my name is Jorge, Jorge Santos. I am from Porto, Portugal. I work in the University of Porto, Portugal. What a coincidence. And I am a web developer at the international office. It's what I do. I develop web applications, tools, uh, digital solutions for the international office. I usually say that my mission is to make people happy at the international office. It's an easy mission. And today I'm here to show you um, the big picture of Erasmus Without Paper Network. Uh, I was told, the coordinators asking me, about midday, people are getting hungry, almost lunch time, so please make a r refresh so that people don't get confused on how do I enter into the network, how do I start, I have a system, I don't have a system. Let's make that clear. And this overview will act as an introduction to these topics, will, which will be presented by the members of EUF, Daiga and Stefan. They will talk about the Erasmus dashboard, which is a tool you will find interesting, and also the EWP Competence Center. First of all, I must say that we are all incredibly proud of today's launch of the EWP network. We all, everybody in this room must be proud of being here in this moment of history. What some time ago seemed the future is now. Here we are in the future. And um, the team, we partner institutions are very proud of what we developed. It was three years of hard work, decisions, problems, solutions, new problems, new solutions, uh, meetings, and uh, in the end, we now have a network, a framework, a set of tools, a set of specifications that allow higher education institutions to connect securely, to exchange <laughs> data, to exchange data in terms of cooperation, the agreements, in terms of student exchange data, you know, uh, you know better than me, but application students' data, nominations, learning agreements, transcript of records at both the home and the host institutions, a certificate of arrival and uh, of departure and arrival. What else? Um, even the latest APIs develop an automatic reporting for the mobility tool. Isn't this a dream? It is. So congratulations, Erasmus Without Paper. That's why. I ask for an applause, not for me, but for Erasmus without paper. <laughs> Do you remember when Valère showed you this slide with this chart? This was a desk research on, um, on the project uh, with a sample of around 1,000 higher education institutions. So 1,000, it's a good sample. And um, if you notice the big slice, the big percentage there, it's th those 42% of institutions that say that they have no specific tools 
they, don't, they still rely on, uh, uh, let's say, classical, maybe spreadsheet, software, email, and things like that. And um, if we think well, 40%, it's almost one half. So in each five institutions, two don't have a system, uh, don't even have uh, an, an, an external service, uh, a commercial software. So they rely on um, tools that don't allow them still to enter into this train of Erasmus without paper. So EWP must go further. And that's why we have a set of solutions. The EWP network is one thing. And it was amazing seeing everything connected, things really working. Uh, however, let's see. I can be a big institution that already have my system, or uh, I developed uh, a system, or, or else I, I bought a commercial software. And what do I need to do? I need to develop a layer on top of that. The IT guys must develop uh, APIs following the specification of Erasmus Without Paper on top of that system. So it will communicate easily with the EWP network. Then you have another level, institutions that uh, maybe want to develop their system. They can develop the system already with the knowledge of Erasmus Without Paper, studying the specification. They have the data model. They can develop a system EWP oriented and create those APIs and the system is connected to the EWP network. Or else, instead of developing the software, they can uh, buy software, uh, commercial software. Uh, I think the commercial companies are here represented. So if you are interested, make your business. Today is the day to make business. And that's the solution because these very good softwares like uh, MoveOn and Mobility Online are connected to the EWP network. They work hard these last years to connect to the EWP network. And what about those institutions that don't have the um, human uh, financial resources to invest in a software or to uh, develop in-house uh, a new software? They can enter into Erasmus. They will not be left behind. There is the Erasmus dashboard, which will be, will be presented after, which is a tool with some advantages. It is free. It runs online, so it has no setup costs. It was developed by the European University Foundation. It is connected to the Erasmus Plus app, and it is a very good entry point for Erasmus. There is this elastic approach, flexible approach. What does this mean? It means that even if an institution has a known software, it may decide not to use their software for entering Erasmus without paper. It may decide to go, for example, through the dashboard to manage uh, inter-institutional agreements. Uh, you decide which APIs you want to connect. You understand? You, you decide what do we want to connect to the EWP network. The Erasmus dashboard is just a tool, a software, already connected to the EWP network. This way, once again, no university is left behind. This is the message to pass. There is no excuse to, to lose this train. So catch it. Thank you. On my side, um, I'm done. And now I'm leaving you with Daig and Stefan, which will present you the Erasmus dashboard. Thank you very much. So yes, um, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Daige from the European University Foundation, and I will very, very briefly present you and walk you through the functionalities of the Erasmus dashboard. Um, a bit of a zoom out first. The tool was launched this year. It happened in February, and it was part of the webinar that was organized by the European Commission, and it was focusing on digital tools for higher education institutions. And since then, we have accumulated quite a nice number of more than 780 higher education institutions that have requested access to it. With the colleagues that are having accounts, it means 1,800 IROs that have an account and have access to it. They have exchanged and generated more than 25,000 online learning agreements within the system, and we have users from 32 countries. 
Those who can uh, have access as of now are those who are holding the Erasmus Charter for Higher Education. So those who have the potential to exchange the Erasmus MOVA students. And with that introduction and without further ado, I will uh, then go to the live demo and actually show you the functionalities and show you the tool. And for that, I will quickly uh, switch my screen because otherwise um, I will have to look back. Um, so this should work now. Yes. So, because otherwise I would, you would see the screen and I would see the presentation and that doesn't work well for using the mouse or using the, using the keyboard. But, so all in all, this is the Erasmus dashboard and this is the, this is the tool. On the side, you see the menu of different features and different options. And these are basically the functionalities that are available to you. And as the first one, I will introduce you the accounts and access, which in essence is the place where you can create a multi-user uh, multi-user system that is really respecting the needs of your institution. So you can set the roles and you can create the different sets of permissions to make sure that um, you can invite the colleagues and really determine of what exactly they can have access to. So you can uh, respect the hierarchies, respect the levels of access that would be necessary for you. And when that is done, and when you have invited the colleagues, um, of course, the main, the main uh, message and the, the main things that you can do with the tool is interacting with the online learning agreements. And the way you can start doing it is by prefilling the learning agreements and actually creating them for your students. And you can do that here in the upload step. For example, I want to select that I, I want to prefill five learning agreements for five of my students, and I create them. And what you see here are different categories of data. And these different categories are, of course, these <coughs> aspects that you have to indicate in the template of the learning agreement. So basically what it means, you can, have, uh, you can get the data from whatever is the place where you're typically having it and using it, and you can input it all at once and make sure that you're profiling those learning agreements for your students without any mistakes and any, without any, any, any things that afterwards can create, create, of course, the delay in the process. And of course, check it and, and, and the information is validated and uh, yes, you can make sure that the things will be smoother. What happens when you click upload all at the moment is that by definition, these learning agreements are created and the students are invited to review them. They are given access to it. If they already, and, and they're given access on their own platform, which is the online learning agreement platform for the students. If they already have an account, they will simply be able to use the existing credentials and just access it and review it and add the missing information, which is, for example, the courses. If they don't have the access as of yet, they will also be invited to finish up the registration for the, for the account. But yes, when, when you have done this part, the students will do theirs, and this is kind of an insight in the system of what it looks for them, what it looks for the student. And for example, yes, in this place, they are indicating the, the courses and they are adding all the information about that. And when they are done with it, of course, that's the next step for you to do your part. They have filled it in, they have indicated the courses, they have committed to this proposal, the, well, the proposal of the learning agreement and signed it. Then you can interact with those, uh, with those learning agreements and here in the student list, you see the list of all of them. The learning agreements and your students. And um, there are different tools, there are different filters that allow you to uh, select the information and sort it, uh, for example, by name or also search for the information for you to be able to find and manage and monitor the information uh, as it's necessary for you. But for example, I want to select all the students that have already signed the learning agreement, and these are these ones. Uh, and in this case, yes, I'll take a deeper look in, in, in this, not really Jane Doe, not as creative, but the first things that you can see is the personal information, you can see the information about the institutions, the sending and also the receiving. You can see the courses in detail. And then you can either commit to it and sign it and confirm, or you can comment on any changes that might be necessary to it. All these features are also available in bulk. So in this case, for example, I'm, I'm ready to sign all of them. I mean, I have reviewed them and everything is fine. Or decline them or 
download them as well, the last PDFs in case it's necessary, or of course remove them. It's also possible to send uh, bulk emails to the students if it's necessary. And another feature that uh, also George highlighted is the connection to the Erasmus Plus app, which is illustrated in this section. And what you see here next to the menu is basically a list of milestones that students should go through when they are carrying out Erasmus Plus mobility. And it's essentially a really a to-do list for them to, for, to support them to carry it out successfully. The different aspects and the different topics and descriptions, uh, it came out from the consultation event uh, from the commission and the group of universities and also the students. And it's really meant as a kind of guide, guidance and, and support for them. And as you see, some of those aspects are grayed out and that means that it would rather be the host university that is taking care of that. But taking a look at one of, it, one of the aspects, for example, information sessions. What you see at first is the general description of what it is about and for the student to understand, okay, like what happens now. You can also have a uh, custom description for your specific institution of what it means and, and how you would maybe do things differently. You can also add a generic deadline about the specific milestone as well as indicate a contact point that might be of use for the student. And you can also have important dates, which is um, information that is also communicated to the Erasmus Plus app as push notifications to the students. So maybe it's an event that you want to, want to tell them about, or it's maybe an urgent deadline in, in some of these aspects, or any other aspect that you really want to draw, your, draw their attention towards. So all of this information that you indicate here is anyways displayed in the app for the student. But, uh, but yes, these important dates and events, you can also communicate as push notifications. And the same applies also when you're sending the, sending the emails and bulk emails to your students. If it's of real urgency, then you can also do it as push notifications. And with that, in general, these will be the main, the main features. And I'll go back to my presentation. Um, and given, given this, so to say, uh, illustration, I'm guessing the question might be, then what's next and what's in the pipeline? And the answer to that would be inter-institutional agreement manager, as well as the application stage to the mobility or the Erasmus virtual assistant. And looking more holistically at the, at the process, these are definitely kind of the aspects in the to-do list to make sure that uh, they can benefit extensively from the digitizing these aspects. And, uh, connecting the dots and, and putting very useful and necessary services at the fingertips of the students as well as the higher education institutions. And I would also invite you to the pilot phase because that's exactly what we're doing with these tools. We are at the moment carrying out the, the, the testing phase and I kind of also want to highlight that the pilot definitely has the best view and the best zoom out and it's definitely also the best way to to steer the ship and we very much appreciate your feedback and, and, and your contribution and we are looking forward to those discussions with you. And with that, I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, Stefan. So I'm fixing technical things first, right? Techniques first and then comes people. Which brings me to my, oh, what happened? I, I, I still like this picture, but I also don't like to hide. Does it work? No battery test. Test, test, my test. Does it work? <coughs> technical issues right from the beginning. Just what we need for a technical uh, conference, right? So I also don't like to, to stand behind the pool. So I'm going to, you know, run around here in the front and kind of bring a bit of energy into the room. Um, so first of all, we caught up a little bit on the agenda, so I have a little bit of time to tell a small anecdote, which is great, because I love to tell stories. So as you heard, we already for quite a few years are developing Erasmus Without Paper. You've seen a lot of the different tools, you've seen all our great colleagues implementing Erasmus Without Paper in their tools. So a lot of things have happened on the IT side of things. Now, a few months back, we finished our first Erasmus Going Digital conference that we as the European University Foundation uh, hosted in Budapest. And afterwards, I had a colleague coming to me and saying, well, I have seen this and I have tried it online, but I really have issues convincing my leadership 
to do this digital change. I am convinced we use an old in-house system and we barely have resources to maintain this system ourselves, but I don't know how to work with my leadership. This brought us in a very difficult situation because, of course, we attacked the IT tools first. We said, well, let's build the IT tools, but now, of course, it comes to the rollout. So now we are launching Erasmus without paper today. So that means we have to now think a little bit further on how do we do this launch. It's probably not enough to just provide you with the tools and say, good luck, get back home safe, and hopefully we'll see you next year again joining Erasmus without paper and being part of uh, this network. So what we have done is that we have built something which we called Erasmus without paper competence center. Now, we have built all the tools, or all the tools that you've seen today are built in a way that they are purpose-built, they are user-friendly, but of course we understand that even though processes will stay the same, and we have heard also from the Commission, no revolution, just an evolution, things in Erasmus will probably be very similar also in the new program. Yet the digital change is one that we still call a revolution, because it is quite new. We still like stamps and signatures, we still like to work with paper documents. Well, usually we don't like to work with them, but we are used to it for many years. So we heard it, digital change is cultural change. And this cultural change can probably not be done by developing just the greatest IT tools out there, but we need to involve people. So what we have done is that we have developed or are developing the Erasmus Without Paper uh, Competence Center. So you see a few screenshots, you will find this since around two days. We have it also live on the uh, erasmuswithoutpaper.eu website. An overview of what Erasmus Without Paper as a competence center is. The aim is re relatively simple. We are trying to support you with different tools and promotional material and different documents and presentations and videos to support you to do this transition into the digital age, into the 21st century. So what we have done is that we have divided the target groups into three different areas. Now, I think it was Barbara who asked who is part of an international relation office. I would like to do another hand-raising exercise. Who of you thinks that Erasmus without paper is probably going to support you in lowering the administrative work at your international relation office after having seen all of these presentations? Would you mind putting your arm up? Okay, many of you. I'll find the ones who haven't raised your arm. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you during the break. Now, who of you, all the ones that raised the arm, thinks that your university or your higher education institution is perfectly geared to start using Erasmus without paper from tomorrow on? One, two, <laughs> Janina, four, five, six, six. Very good. So this is exactly the reason why we have created the Erasmus without paper competence center. And we have also divided the different information that you can already find on the Erasmus without paper competence center into three categories. There is a category for Erasmus mobility coordinators. But there's also a, a category for higher education institution leadership. So people that are the decision makers very often, the heads of international relation offices, maybe the vice rectors, the ones that actually have to decide and say, we are going to now allocate some resources and take the decision that we are going to switch to a digital administration of Erasmus. So also for them, it is quite important to be there and have certain material for them to take this decision, understand what is the efficiency gains, why is it important, why is the commission supporting it, what is the policy background, maybe something that is not so relevant for the practitioners, but definitely important for decision makers. And last, but definitely not least, some of you that you have your in-house systems and you want to connect to Erasmus without paper, well, your IT teams or your ICT teams will have to integrate their system with Erasmus without paper. So of course, there's plenty of uh, IT lingua, technical documentation uh, that has already been created that is in this competence center. So this is the three categories of people that we want to cater for to support the transition into this Erasmus without paper uh, age. Now, there is also some infographs, some very simple ones. You've seen this in a different format already. Very simple. So what is your different reality? You know, do you have no tool or do you use a third-party provider or do you have an in-house software? So simple explanations of what is your reality at your institution and what applies to you. And then, of course, depending on these, you can then be guided towards tutorials and different information for the particular use case that applies to you. 
Now, the beauty of this all is that, of course, we have a very complex situation out there. We don't want to change that everybody uses the same system. We want everyone to use whatever they like, but interconnected, interconnecting all systems. So depending on where you stand in this uh, format, you know, you will have your particular use case and you will need your particular instructions on how to move forward and become digital. Now, as I said, there is already quite a lot of things there. You can check it out even in the break or tomorrow or whenever you are back home. Um, for example, there are some instructional videos, there are some documents which are tutorial step-by-step -step guides. Um, there is a, a very lengthy FAQ which we also want to extend and kind of work on as soon as more uh, institutions join the network. As I mentioned, you have some infographics, there's plenty of technical documentation, a lot of things that are already required, and also some support documents, as, as I mentioned, so to, for example, find out more about the policy context and to, to learn simply more about why is Erasmus without paper and where is it heading in the future. So all of this exists to some extent already, but of course we want to develop more, and we will need your help to understand better how we can cater for your needs. So I you know, encourage you to, to get involved. Oh, what is happening? Again, technical things. I clicked too many times. I got too excited about the, the, the competence center. But Daiga is fixing it for me, which I very much appreciate. Thank you, Daiga. So, getting back to the slide. But of course, we already have some plans for the future. So, for example, we want to create a help desk that would allow us to work more efficiently with institutions. At the moment, what we at the European University Foundation Secretariat do is something very similar to what you do with students. We receive a bunch of emails with requests and we have to try to cater for everyone that has questions about Erasmus without paper. And it's quite difficult sometimes to keep the overview, what is the current status and what, what's happening. So we, of course, want to, want to build some sort of help desk and ticket systems in 2019 that would allow us to make this more efficient and for you to submit the request and see the request again and to build something, sort of an infrastructure behind this support system for, for helping you in, in this digitalization process. And then we want to also get away from just having all the information on the website, as it is right now, but we want to build a more advanced wiki. We all probably know Wikipedia, the main wiki that exists, but it, there's, you can set up a separate wiki and there you can you know, do, do different things, which I will not go into great details, but the idea is to make this as user-friendly and as positive of an experience for you to do the transition into the digital age. Because, as I said, Digital change is cultural change, and building the best tools is the first step, but getting people on board and supporting them and doing this change is our second step. And I think this is really what we want to focus on uh, in 2019. This is my last slide, so I would like to thank you for your attention, and I encourage you to get in touch with us also during the breaks if you have any input on what you require to become part of this demonstration maybe in the next uh, conference so that you can go digital together with us. Thank you very much. Be before we go to lunch, I have one practical announcement. We are dealing with student mobility, not yet with staff mobility. So if anybody from the audience needs original signatures and stamps, you can hand over your mobility agreements at the registration desk, and then we will take care of it, and you can take it back tomorrow after the last session. So unfortunately, we're still focused on student mobility. I guess many of you still need the stamps and signatures. Maybe in the future, Erasmus paper can also look into staff mobility. Time is now for lunch. Please enjoy and see you after lunch. Thank you.
issues to align the university policy in terms of mobility with what it is technologically available in the infrastructure that you showed us this, the, this morning. So without further ado, I have a couple of questions to my colleagues here at the panel and one of them is to, uh, uh, to ask uh, the persons here, and I will start probably with, with Guido, uh, for Vice Rector for, for, for Ghent, uh, what uh, is our expectations as policymakers at university completely met by what we've seen this morning, and uh, are, the university, are the universities as a whole ready to embrace this new way of working uh, with, uh, with, this, with these procedures for, for mobility. So I, I will uh, ask what is his opinion on, on this. Okay, thank you. And also on my behalf, welcome here in this afternoon session. Um, it's clear that uh, Ghent University, uh, as was also shown this morning, is of course involved from the start and is uh, even a, a main promoter of this Erasmus without paper, so it should be uh, a little bit strange to say that we are not interested or not uh, in, in the application. But of course, um, with the start of the network, uh, uh, only as was said also I think this morning, uh, oh, it's only the start, the real work has still uh, to happen now. Uh, also in our university, uh, because we are a university, we have developed our own system uh, called OASIS. It was shown, uh, shown also this morning. Uh, um, and so to connect with all the universities in, the, in Europe, uh, uh, of course now there are 10 universities involved or something like that. And okay, maybe more if you, those that, that use the, the, the more general softwares. But in total, uh, we have, for example, uh, more than 500 partners, so it's uh, really still a, a big work ahead, a long, long road ahead of us to, to really um, prove that it can work. Uh, and also uh, that the, the people in charge, because I think uh, so far it are mainly the people supporting uh, the um, administration who have worked together because you need to, to know something about IT and, so, and things like that. Uh, but the real people working, uh, let's say, on the administration uh, should be, of course, now uh, that I think that is the next step also to, to involve them and to, to make that the tools are available to them and that they can work with them. Uh, and uh, given that we have our own network, I think in our university, there is still uh, work to do in order to uh, develop these APIs. Uh, we have already developed some, uh, I know, but uh, uh, some of them have still to be developed in order to be able to, to work together with our 500 partners. And if you calculate in, for the whole of Europe, uh, there are more than 4,000 universities in Europe, so uh, it's still a big challenge, I think. Uh, and uh, for that, of course, in order to give an, an incentive uh, also to, to, to put it on the agenda of, uh, for example, the Board of Governors or, or, or the people who have to decide about budgets, uh, uh, I think it is very important also that European Commission and the national agencies give also uh, a sign that this is really the, go the way to go because of course if there is not certain pressure of uh, yeah you should do this then also we are even if we are big promoters of that uh, it will remain uh, 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 yeah, probably difficult to convince everybody in the organization that uh, we should do this so uh, uh, yeah we are optimistic, but there is still a long way to go, I think, and, and uh, certainly still decisions to be taken. And, uh, and for, for the other panelists, what do you think, uh, for your own institutions, your own uni universities, what do you think will be the impact of this kind of digitalization that is going on and the speed and improvements of efficiency that this kind of technology will bring to the entire mobility process? That's so what's important, yes. 
Hello, everybody. I have to begin by saying that as it went very well this morning, it met our expectations. Thank you, uh, all of those who are involved. I'm thanking my own university, too. I'm, I come from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. We were involved in the Erasmus Without uh, um, Paper project, and uh, we do believe in it. Uh, I'm not an IT person. I come from the discipline of psychology, so I will talk a bit more about the people and not the technology involved. Um, I am convinced that technology is there. We have made a very significant progress in establishing uh, EWP really, uh, who I think will change the whole um, Erasmus Plus uh, mobility and in general mobility among uh, European universities for both uh, students, staff, and academic community. Uh, I saw today that um, most of the IRO officers being here, they were very happy of the less workload they will have to do. But we know very well that there are uh, many people in the whole administration rank that they will be, let me say, reluctant. I don't know if you share with me the experience when you're trying to change something and the answer from the administrative people is, this is not the way we do it. So uh, we will have to talk more about it on how to change this idea. It, it's a cultural change. I think Stefan was absolutely right when he said that. That's for now. So uh, how this cultural change is going to happen in, in, in Hungary? <clears throat> well, as my own field is Chinese studies, so I would, I would talk about how this is happens in China. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I think if you if see the world, and I, I, I don't really understand the, the question here, so why should we persuade somebody about which, which, which should be evident for everybody? Uh, so I think, I think the world is, is very clearly, I mean, goes this direction. I mean, in China, if you have an if you have iPhone, you can do anything with, with, with your telephone. You, you can buy things starting from a supermarket up to the flea market. You, you can use only your phone. You, you, you can pay to anybody. Uh, so, uh, so this kind of d digitalization I, I mean, in China is so widespread. So, so basically, you don't, you don't use cash anymore, anymore in China. Uh, so I think, uh, and all, all kinds of administration in China as well, it, it's, it, it, you, can, you can do online uh, everything. So I think it's uh, a little bit, little bit, little bit um, I'm far behind, I think, the, the, from the development. So I think if you really want to catch up, I mean, I mean it, it's something we, we should do. And I think it's, uh, and, and um, I think many universities, I think, would need this kind of, uh, support from from uh, from the commission. I, I mean, just uh, uh, to to provide this kind of tools for the universities uh, that uh, which we could, we could have easily get access, and we could use all our Erasmus uh, administration online and in the digital way. So I think it's a it's a wonderful project which which we just uh, we just uh, saw here in in the morning, and we could we could see that it's useful and and it, it, it's working. Uh, so I. Uh, as university leader, I, I, I give full support uh, for this, and uh, I very hope that very soon it will be it will be uh, available uh, and it, uh, widespread in, in Europe and all, to all universities. Okay. Manuel, if you permit me a of comment, course, course. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Uh, we all, we all look what happens in China because actually they're much ahead of us, but. Um, uh, in Europe, I think we have a tradition of working bottom up, and we did that. At this stage, we did, but I think we also need now a top-down approach. The European Commission, Erasmus uh, Plus agencies will have to adopt this policy, this look towards, towards technology. It has to be... I would dare say mandatory for everybody. We cannot expect, you know, the most prepared universities to start and then the rest to follow at some point in time. We have to do it now if we want to be in the future, which is now. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
obviously the Chinese government has some advantages in relationship with Europe. They dictate, it's mandatory, and everyone has to follow. Europe, fortunately, is a little bit different. So uh, I, I completely agree. The, the, the way to go is to build it bottom up. And uh, to do it properly, we need students to support these uh, kinds of infrastructure. I have to know about it. So uh, my next question here is, uh, is to João. And uh, I would like to ask him uh, the students' view of these improvements and how do you think this new kind of digitalization will improve and in a certain way will be more aligned to what you, or with your expectations because you young people, the, the students nowadays, they are digitally born citizens. I was born in an age where there were no computers, no internet, and we only had one TV channel to watch from the five, at five o'clock in the afternoon, and that's what, that was it. Nowadays, uh, and I know because I'm a father, I have uh, people, my, my, my sons are at university now, and I see a generation gap that is important for us decision makers to understand and, and be aligned with. So uh, I was asking João now, what, he, what is his feels about this, uh, the impulse for digitalization now we, and how important it is for the students' lives? Um, yes, indeed. I mean, we, we have been part of this consortium since the very beginning um, and, and for a reason. Uh, it's really because uh, if we work uh, for the students, I think that the students have to be involved not only in, in panel discussions, but it's in actual work behind the curtain. And this is something we have been proudly doing together with our partners since the very beginning. Um, when it comes to perceptions, uh, it's very clear that there is a difference between uh, what we would call digital natives and uh, analog uh, natives, perhaps, yeah. uh, to level a vast generation uh, like this. Um, let's not forget that the students that are entering in the university this year were born after the release of the movie Matrix. Everybody remembers these kind of movies. Uh, the Spice Girls had broken up already. It's a completely another generation that is no longer uh, in the same cultural mindset that some of us, and I'm 30, I'm not that uh, old as well, but I remember many of these things, that some of us uh, were not uh, at the time. What is the reality is that we conducted um, many surveys, uh, focus groups, um, interviews. We, we have a report here, especially on the midterm student report on EWP, soon available online, um, where uh, we have concluded that, uh, most importantly, uh, the fact that the paper by itself, not, not so much the procedure, but the paper by itself disappears, helps in the perception of the digital natives when it comes to the procedures. Sometimes uh, so the students will feel that the process is complicated, but not because it has many steps, but because it has many papers and many people, so many different people that you have to go to, many different offices that you have to go to and collect opinions from and signatures from, while at the same time I can easily order my meal from my phone. So there is clearly a very different uh, rhythm in which the students live when it comes to the university life and when it comes to student exchange, but when it comes to all the other aspects of their lives. So most definitely the students welcome these, uh, these uh, changes. Now, practically speaking, to give just a couple of examples, um, when it comes to OLA, to the learning agreement, there's 67% of the students uh, that change their learning agreement when they arrive, data from the European Commission uh, 2016. Well, 67%, the majority of these 67 change because when they get to, uh, to the university, the course does not exist, or there are language um, barriers, or something has happened that, they, that needs, leads them to change the, the agreement. If it's easy for them to change it already from the computer and the data can travel easily, um, this number, which does not, uh, is not supposed to achieve zero, uh, will somehow reduce. Uh, and that's a particular example of how uh, we see the change happening, which is a mobile a change of perception. Okay. Um, does anyone uh, want to comment on, on, on this? Uh, because... We have to think about it. 67% succeed to not change their agreements, right? Not changes, they, they change when they arrive. They did change it. 
Okay, so that's about two thirds of our students. If you multiply that, if, I mean, if you count it in numbers, and the number of papers and signatures and stubs Maybe. needed for that, it's really unbelievable. And uh, I guess the plan is to go beyond the Erasmus program. This has to happen for the full body of students throughout Europe, if we want to really see the future. And there's, there's another thing. We've all seen uh, systems oriented for business processes, for, for the international relations offices. But I think one thing that is lacking in the program, and it should be included in the next steps or the next versions, would be the mobile support for the students' interactions. Because nowadays, uh, young people, they don't use computers. They basically, they use computers, but just to write word, word f reports and things like that. But the majority of interactions is done by mobile platforms. And without mobile platforms, we cannot engage students in these kind of programs as they should be. And this kind of facility or changing programs or collecting uh, uh, the agreements, they should be enabled by uh, mobiles. And that's my my opinion on, on, on that. So it's just a, a suggestion for, and I think it would be helpful for us to engage students bottom up to make this program even more important than it is today. Because I feel that to, and that's, that is, as, as an European, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big def defender of the uh, European Union. I feel uh, I am uh, an European citizen my sons are more than, than European citizens. They basically are citizens of the world. That's the way they think. They don't have a country. They feel, they feel at home wherever there, there is internet, basically. If they want to, to the, the middle of Africa, if they have internet, they will feel at home. So you really have to engage this mindset. And for that to, to occur, uh, mobility programs are absolutely essential to build uh, European uh, identifi uh, citizenship identification. Uh, they, they, they want to feel at home wherever there is internet and I hope Europe could be the place where people can move around with, mo the, with, with this kind of mobility programs and feel at home wherever they are. That's why Erasmus is so important and that's why we welcome people to come to our a university and we, we have many programs and do a lot of effort to make them feel at home and uh, this kind of, of facilities of not having to deal with bureaucratic hurdles is very important for people to feel at home because at home they don't have those these kind of difficulties okay so, uh, so uh, that's that's basically it in, in terms of of, uh, of, 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 of students' interactions with, uh, with the program. So uh, we are a little bit ahead of, of time, so I, I have more questions to, to ask. Uh, what do we think uh, are the critical success factors in making Erasmus uh, without paper a reality? What are the major difficulties in the sense that we still have to, uh, to conquer in terms of policy because techn technological, uh, technological things are easy. I am a technologist, I understand the problem. It's easy because we are dealing with machines. When things start to, to involve people and social relations and, and, and policies and politics, things become really hard. And that's the thing that I think is m still missing in terms of, of uh, Erasmus is the most difficult part of the Erasmus program is the politics. So what do you think in terms of politics is the, is the challenge ahead that must be solved to make this program work? So uh, I make a general question. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it has already been said. Uh, I, I think this can only be a success if indeed everybody, all universities are uh, connected and, and participate uh, uh, because there is also a danger if they don't participate at a certain moment and uh, that some uh, university which is working with uh, Erasmus without paper will only select other universities which have it also so if we if inclusiveness as was said this morning by Vanessa is very important I think also inclusiveness of all university 
is very important. So that's, that's I think, a major challenge. And then how to, to reach that, uh, I think, in one way of, of whether you call it mandatory or you give uh, a high incentive to, to connect. But I think there should be some pressure on the institutions to do it because Otherwise, you, you will always be in, in a divide. Uh, institutions that want to use it, but if the ma majority of their partners are not using it, then they will say, yeah, well, we are using two systems and we have still work to do. Uh, because, of course, it's indeed, uh, uh, we speak about Erasmus without paper, but we should not forget it is Erasmus with people, uh, with students, but also staff working with the students. And I think this is a, a, a chance from Paul policy point of view also to increase the quality of support that we give to students because now uh, the people who are guiding the students through the process they are yeah, mostly guiding papers through the process and not the students so while of course uh, w what was said about for example the courses where why are the courses uh, and why is the learning agreement not uh, reality because of course yeah the, the people have not time to say to the student, yeah, but uh, let's work together. Let's see what is really your interest in studying. Uh, I know the partner there. Uh, I know their course offer. And I think that is what our people in the administration should do and not, uh, let's say, uh, putting papers from one place to another because yep. that is what they do. And I think that is the main policy uh, issue, I think. Okay. Yes. If I, may, if I may build on that, um, yes, I, I think that at the end this is a lot about HR allocation because what happens with change is that while we have to change something, the current processes still have to happen until the change is fully made. So while change is happening, there is more work because change is happening. So we, we, when, when planning how to make this change, it is important to allocate proper resources, proper HR resources and to train them. I, I think one of the key elements in here is to invest in staff training. Well, investing in human capital should be a reality all the time, everywhere. Human capital is the, the most important capital. Um, but when change happens, investing in the transformation in the capital is, uh, is essential. And we saw it before, when, when Stefan asked uh, how, how many people here believe that EWP is important, the majority said yes. How many think this you can change tomorrow? The minority said, said yes. So there is uh, some investment to be done there. And also, of course, at the um, cultural change that we keep, change, keep saying, and I can stress more that at the end of the day, I believe this is not about the tools. The tools are getting there. It's about the people that need to change their perception about the given tools. Yep. Yes, of course. I'll get my psychologist self out. I see what the administration on the university level and on Europe's level has to do something like a good parenting mode. A good parent sets up the rules. We have to make it mandatory for the children, but also he or she has expectations for the children and aspirations, but also provides the means to do it. Facilitation, teaching, every day educating in the new means that is this electronic community. Okay. Thank you. And let me add one other thing. It's, ah, sorry, you want to? Uh, yes. Okay, please then. I, well, I completely agree that, of course, uh, uh, once the technology is there, the, and it's very important to train the people okay. and, to, and to change their, their thinking about, about, uh, about how things uh, should be done. But sometimes it's also there's a kind of objective problem. This is the funds, whether the university has enough fund, I mean, I mean to, to, to carry out all, the, all these changes. And this fund may be for training for these people, but it's a fund for, for, for use for developing new technologies, which maybe somehow, I mean, just, just um, <coughs> needs uh, to, to, to have uh, connections with, with the local, local uh, systems. Uh, so I think it's also have some, some, uh, some other, I mean, objective uh, I mean, requirements. And maybe uh, European Commission I mean, could uh, give uh, some support in this in this uh, in this regard as well, and maybe that could be useful. I mean, for those uh, universities who cannot afford, I mean, to to, in, uh, to invest, uh, I mean, so much money into into this uh, project. Thank you. Okay, uh, one thing that the Commission could uh, promote is to make organisations at a more regional and country uh, level. I, I, I mean. Uh, I come from Portugal, it's a very small country. We don't have so many universities, but basically 
Porto is well represented here, but I don't see uh, many people from the other universities participating in these kind of programs because it's hard. They, are, they have other priorities, other resources, so it will be very important to promote regional cohesion, helping make regional groups that could have exchange software, exchange experiences, do common platforms. This kind of stuff is very important for small countries because uh, our universities will like funds for everything and probably these kind of, of interoperability questions are not on the top of priorities and they should be because they lower costs and they make the service much more efficient. And at the, at the end of the line, there will be savings, considerable savings in terms of the cost of, of supporting mobility. So uh, this is another, another hint that should be uh, aligned with, uh, with the policies that we all want to make in Europe. Uh, now, uh, changing for another Another question, uh, what, uh, and aligned with, the, with the, the saving costs, what uh, do you think will be the savings in terms of the human resources that are needed to, to, uh, to promote and process this kind of bureau, bureau, the work for the, the bureaucracy associated with these processes when done in paper? Uh, it's very high. Do you think that we'll be able to promote much more students with this kind of technologies and will the savings be enough to justify the investment that we need to make to uh, promote this kind of technologies? Because it's just not, not just a question of seeing, we see that the, the Erasmus without paper, the, the framework works. We see it demonstrated. But now we all have or the other, the, the other universities involved at the European level, they have to buy software or they have to adapt their systems to participate in Erasmus without paper. And that costs uh, a lot. The investment is high. Do you think it is um, enough uh, to save on the, on the processes and the speed and the efficiency of the process will be sufficient to justify the cost? That's my... My, my, my question. I didn't have, I, I'm the guy responsible for information system at Port University, and I haven't still done all the math. I haven't put the spreadsheet and see, oh, this is, saves me 500,000 euros. I don't know that, okay? So I'm asking, do you have a feel for this? The savings will be significant or, 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 or not? Well, I don't know whether you can put this in maths. I think it's, uh, uh, a kind of, well, there are two aspects, I think. On the one side, indeed, uh, we, we heard it also this morning, and uh, the Erasmus, next Erasmus uh, Plus program will, will be even bigger, larger, more uh, students, more short-term mobilities, that was also said. So that means that more, uh, yeah, students will have to, to be registered and, and so on. So uh, that's certainly already a factor. I don't, I don't think that, uh, at least in my university at this moment, there is uh, resources to put more people uh, on the support. So somewhere, uh, this economics of scale that is generated by the using this this kind of programs will will make it possible to handle more students and and to uh, and the second thing is what i have already said uh, before is that we should not only think in, uh, about yeah the number of people working on that but also on the quality of their work and i think okay. uh, that that digital tools uh, should increase the quality of the work and 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 that is the major uh, improvement, I think, with this kind of, of tool. So uh, if some people in this room would be afraid and then, oh, tomorrow they will, not, they will need less IROs, I don't think that will be uh, the case. I think we, but with the same group of people uh, that we can handle, indeed, uh, a larger number of students because we all, at, also in our university, we don't only think about those that are mobile, uh, but also those that are staying here by virtual mobility, internationalization at home, and so on. And you also will need to, to register things about that uh, uh, because also there you have to prove that students have the competences uh, and so on. So 
how we can handle that with the same number of people, that is the main question. So not thinking about, okay, we, maybe we can do it with 10 people less. I don't, I don't believe in that. I think it is quality of work and the number and the economics of scale that, will, that can be, uh, that are in, in play here. Anyone want to add anything or something? I, uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, we haven't done the math either, but it's not about reducing 10 people from the International Relations Office and sending 100 students more abroad through Europe. It's about the quality of mobility and it's about uh, making every student in a uni European university feel a part of European universities in general, so this is more important. Of course, we need money for that. Hey, Commission! <laughs> of course, we need more funding. Well, in terms of uh, the quality uh, development, maybe one, <coughs> one thing is general, it should be useful because we could gain a much easier lot, lot of statistics. I mean, about this Erasmus Erasmus program. So, whatever if I want to know any kind of which countries come, how many, how many students, uh, which subjects. So I think if you have this kind of unified uh, programs, I mean, it, it's much easier to create a database and then and then to just in, in a minutes have all kinds of all kinds of informations, which usually I mean, university leaders need all these kind of informations. And sometimes now we have to wait. I mean several days, I mean, to, to, to get this information because on you know, an extra file, I mean, it, it, it needs much more time than, 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 than maybe it, it, it could be. Um, can you add something? Yes, please. And uh, maybe it's uh, too much of a wishful thinking, but I, I want to believe that uh, freeing up human resources will translate into actually attracting investment somehow, because there will be people with more time to look into other opportunities, other financial sources, uh, more agreements for the students, more agreements for staff training, because people will actually be where humans need to be, which is in the creative process, and not so much in the uh, uh, bureaucratic part. Okay. And another important thing is some, many of our departments are already uh, completely dedicated to uh, business processes, processes that are, uh, that are not needed anymore if you take the paper out of the equation. So in the end, I expect them to be able to process much more mobilities and more mobilities makes the program more successful. So it is one of the key points, I think, to become one of the important outcomes of this kind of project is more, more students served, more students happy, and uh, more people involved in, in mobility across Europe. And for us, pro at least in Portugal, it's very important for us to receive students from abroad. One of our biggest problems, I don't know if you know, but Portugal has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. We are almost as, as bad as Japan. And it's a real, a real policy problem for universities for, because, because in the next few years, our universities, some of them, are expected to have a 30% 30, 30 cut on the number of national students. And it's going to be a disaster for some of our universities. And some of them, they see mobility as one of the possible ways of solving our problem. Okay? So uh, that's, uh, that's reality. And my question is, do you have the same problems in, in your universities? Because uh, I don't know why, but Portuguese, they don't, we don't have children anymore. I don't know why, but. I have a Portuguese wife. I have no problems with that. <laughs> But it's actually maybe, uh, maybe it, it, we can send we can send Belgian students to Portugal. Please send Belgian <laughs> students to Portugal. <laughs> so, uh, do you think do, do you think uh, mobility is a way of solving uh, this kind of, of problems? Because it's not uh, it's a it's a European problem. It's not just Portugal. Portugal, unfortunately, has one of the lowest. But there are other countries with this kind of problems. So, mobility in a way. It's, uh, it's, it's not just for exchanging experience, but if the, the students, they like the, the university so much, we welcome them to stay there and, and, and do their lives and build their lives there. That's, that's one of the, 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 the questions I'd like to know. Do, do, do you think students use mobility to, uh, not just to enrich themselves, but to change their lives and live abroad and these kind of, of things are very important? So what, what is your view on this? That mobility changes 
the life. I think that's certainly true. But uh, and that there is, I, d I don't know whether it's really uh, about number of students. Uh, uh, I don't think we have already that problem here. But it's uh, <coughs> what we hear is that in industry there is, of course, the okay. the war for talent. Uh, it's not all also there. It's not only the numbers, but the quality again. I think and uh, and that. Uh, uh, attracting uh, people, skilled people, or people that you can educate yourself is, of course, one of the of the reasons for internationalization of universities as a whole. Also, that debate is is uh, playing here in Belgium. Yeah. Okay. Anyone like to comment on? on, on? I, I may comment. I, I, I like to see mobility more at a balanced level, in which we send and receive more or less the same amount of students. Otherwise, we risk to pass the board of a brain drain, which is uh, not beneficial for, um, for anybody. Um, at the same time, we do know, of course, that Erasmus students and the Erasmus Beck study, uh, another study we were part of, has shown that 40% of Erasmus alumni um, <coughs> moved to another country after the first year of, of graduation, 40%, uh, compared with only 23% of non-mobile students. So already there, you can see that perhaps, yes, many Belgians went to Portugal, but hopefully many Portuguese also came to Belgium um, and at the end of the day, this all contributes, maybe not to solve fertility problems, but to <laughs> solve the ch some of the challenges we, that we face as United Europe. Okay. Uh, please. Yes, please. I think mobilization and this kind of mobility programs, I mean, I mean it also helps, I mean, I mean uh, to university, I mean, to become more international, internationalization, and at, at the same time, I mean, to give a, a, a possibility to, to the local students, I mean, to have more connect connections with, with, with foreign students. And in this way, I mean, your, your own university becomes much more international, and, and, and that's why you, you, you don't much, maybe you don't much to, uh, want to leave uh, uh, the country, because you can have the international, I mean, environment in, in your own university. So I think in these terms, I mean, this kind of Erasmus program is also can be very useful, and you can, all universities can, can <clears throat> maybe start more uh, 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 academic programs in English, and, and the, our, our local students also can attend these English programs, not only the, the programs in, in local, local languages, and in this way they have more, more time and more opportunity to study, to study together with, with, the, with the foreign and international students. Um, yes, please. Um, I would like to see students, academic students, as our, the population that we are there to serve them. Um, I never thought of uh, they could, you know, decrease in fertility problems or, uh, you know, uh, lessen populations in the university or brain drain. Of course, these are very important issues. And from Greece, where I come from, uh, these are hard issues. But university students are not a product, um, you know, a commodity that we should use in our calculations for saving our countries. It's about educated, educating all European students and the students of the world, not just Europe, alike with quality education. Thank you. Okay, and uh, I, I will take these words just to add that uh, it's, we are focused in Europe but I think uh, European values are universal, and mobilities from outside Europe are also uh, an integral part of the, the program, and in the sense that it's the best way to, um, what's, to make our values, our social values, as universal as possible. Every time someone from Africa, from Brazil, from Asia comes to Europe for, to study, they, in a sense, they incorporate uh, our values, and they become an ambassador of Europe when they go back to their own countries. And that's, that's also a very important issue, and just not, not just internal mobilities. International mobilities outside of Europe are also, I think, should be an integral part of the program, and they are very important for us as Europeans because we want our values, and in a sense our values are universal because the Western culture is, is, Western culture is not just in Europe. It's, it's becoming widespread in the globe. So uh, do you have any, any, any other comments on, on this? Well, and I, the values, and the values. I, I would 
not speak in terms of European values and, and, and because I think <laughs> also other values are yeah, important. So I think it's ex again the exchange, as you said, it is, uh, for example, that, that indeed Uh, uh, for example, myself, I, I am an uh, agricultural economist. I, t I was teaching courses in agricultural policy, and in the beginning, I had only Belgian students. Automatically, you teach agricultural policy from a Belgian viewpoint. Later on, I had a mixed classroom with students from, I think, in total, uh, uh, something like 90 countries, if I count all the, the years together. And, and of course, you teach also you yourself, you teach this course totally different because, of course, uh, how can you uh, uh, say to an, a European student, look, if you have uh, oversupply of milk, it is destroying the markets in Africa. And, and when an African student say to a European student, look what happens with your policy, then he has a totally other view on, on this. And I think that is really the, the value of, of these programs and, of course, the administration because here today we speak about how to, to support these administrative processes that we, we should not forget that we do it for that, uh, so that we support administration in order to get that kind of, of uh, exchange of ideas. I think that is the most important lesson uh, that we never should forget. Uh. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, no, I think uh, we have the 45 minutes of, of uh, of our session. I think we can take some questions if someone wants to make them. I think it's a good opportunity to, to learn from or, or hear from, uh, from uh, people responsible for university uh, administrative and, uh, and politics decision makers. So uh, anyone has any question just to, uh, to wrap the session? No question. You, you all agree of what you have said, we no, said. Agree, so it's, uh, <laughs> so oh. it's, it's the clock. <laughs> it's the machine that is saying they, they rule our lives. <laughs> Sorry and then you don't know to stop it. <laughs> Bomb diffused. <laughs> so, uh, 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 if there are no further questions, do you want to say anything? Just one, one, one last thing. Okay, uh, João is, 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 is... No, just, uh, just one, last, uh, one last comment, still, of course, for with WP. Um, when I come to these conferences uh, and, and having this age, I, I keep hearing that we have to bring Erasmus or university life into the 21st century. And I cannot keep avoiding to think that we are already one-fifth into the 21st century. So for how long are we going to keep using this rhetoric? It's time to accept that actually uh, us keeping saying that we have to move into the 21st century is nothing more than us expressing our frustration with the fact that the present is not as we imagined it to be back in 2000. Uh, so it's time for us to embrace technology, it's time for us to make this cultural change and finally enter into the 21st century. Yes, we now proceed to the next discussion, which is about developers helping developers. And we have two people who will help you go through that. There will be more, 
I gather anyway. So Anthony Vickers from the University of Essex, who is also the evaluator of the project, will lead this session. And we also have uh, Benjamin Nizet from Microsoft, um, who will also be contributing towards that. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Valère. Uh, maybe it's apt that somebody from uh, a country that's about to depart from the European Union should be the assessor here. I don't know. You know, never mind. <laughs> Possibly. We won't leave. Who knows? Today is an exciting day. Uh, but putting that aside, uh, I just want to uh, chair this session. and We hope we're going to get uh, some... Uh, views from the floor, but we do have uh, two colleagues here, uh, a colleague from Microsoft and a colleague from uh, University of Thessalonica. Uh, the colleague from Microsoft is going to tell you how wonderful open source uh, uh, ideas are, and our colleague from Thessalonica will say a few words about what they've uh, provided already. So uh, if I know how to, uh, no, I think we're going to just go on one slide on the other one first, on the main one. All right. Can you? Okay, so I just have one slide, and uh, it's taken from uh, something that many of you may not know, which is something called Modern Agile. And Modern Agile is really the way in which software developers are hopefully moving towards uh, seeing the world and how they uh, provide service to it. And um, the, there has four main elements to Modern Agile. Uh, make people awesome. Okay. I'm sure everybody that's been in this project is awesome. And uh, from the, uh, the tension this morning, uh, you can see they even have the, the, the ability to create theater. So uh, software people are not people that hide in cupboards and do strange things, okay? They, they produce wonderful things. They deliver value continuously. So it's always, always being delivered continuously. Okay? Make safety a prerequisition. So have to produce systems that you feel comfortable with you feel safe with and experiment and learn rapidly we lots of the discussion has been about the fact that we're we're in a changing world we're in a changing world that is changing ever fast and uh, sometimes that's a bit daunting but uh, it does mean that people need to experiment and, and learn rapidly uh, and one last thing I'd say before I uh, hand over to our colleague from Microsoft is this is an area that requires people to, ima to be imaginative and creative, but to listen to the customers. Most of you here have acknowledged that you're from uh, international uh, relations offices. You need to be served with good software. I hope what you're seeing so far tells you that. And what we're going to talk about now is another way in which the project can serve you quality software. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to our colleague now. He knows which buttons to press. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Benjamin. Um, I'm actually the education account executive for Microsoft. Um, I'm originally a French teacher, which you can guess with this strange accent uh, I can't get rid of. Um, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about Microsoft and, and open source. Um, when I got the title of this conference, Erasmus Without Paper, um, I couldn't uh, have another picture than this one. Um, this is actually my, my real dorm room uh, as an Erasmus student. Um, so maybe if I, sh if I would have known that uh, it has an impact on fertility in Europe, I would have cleaned it up. <laughs> anyway, that's not the point. Um, I want to talk to you about this room because this is where I started coding in open source. Um, I've actually, um, I'm a French teacher, as I said, and I, um, like 14 years ago, I discovered that teachers were not sharing documents to each other, uh, and, and their job is actually to share knowledge. So I was thinking, okay, let's do a website, let's code it, and let's make sure that the teachers can share their documents together. Um, and then, you know, at that time when you wanted to be higher in, the, in search engines, the best would be to actually have bigger websites would do a link to you. So I thought, okay, what are the big websites? Obviously, Microsoft was one of them. <laughs> so I actually dropped an email to Microsoft 
And I said, hey, uh, I'm actually uh, a student, I have long hairs, um, and uh, I love open source, and I've built uh, this website for, for teachers where they can share their knowledge. Would you mind um, doing a link to, uh, to my website? Thank you. Um, <laughs> and they actually say no. <laughs> um, but, but they offer me a job. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, okay, a link, a job. Uh, so I took the job. And, and, and this is how I'm, I'm, I'm here talking to you about open source and, and Microsoft. Uh, at that time, when they offered me a job, I actually considered it, it like to say no. Um, because I was open source, long hair, I told you. Uh, I was like, no, Microsoft, thank you. I just want your link. Um, and, uh, and then I was thinking, okay, um, let's go and, and have a look at what, what's inside this company. Um, 14, four, 14 years later, uh, things have changed uh, a lot in, in the tech world. Um, so, yeah, now I get a badge. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is our CEO, uh, so it's Satya, and he told judges by the action that we are taking in the recent past, uh, in our actions today and in the future. Um, and just a summary of what happened in the last four years. Um, so Satya said Microsoft loves Linux, which was a bold statement at that time. Um, then we, I, I, don't, I won't go into the details, but these, these are the technical things that we have, the big ones that we have made in the last four years. Uh, the last one that you might have uh, known is actually that we acquired uh, GitHub, which is the source of, of the repository of all open source projects, or of a lot of open source projects. Um, and, and to give you an idea, uh, our cloud, Azure, uh, is trending to have 50% of the workloads uh, running on Linux or open source technologies. So we are deeply committed into, into, um, into open source. These are actually the, the contributions that Microsoft employees are doing on an open source project. As you can see, four years from now, we were like around 100,000 contributions. Uh, last year, we were already seven times bigger. Uh, so we are one of the biggest contributors in the open source world. Um, and I want to talk to you about three main things in open source. Um, innovate, contribute, and enable. By innovate, I want to um, discuss that with open source, you can, we are actually um, creating new language programming technologies. We are not just using open source projects, we are actively contributing to it. Um, here are a few examples uh, in our cloud, uh, Azure. We are also open sourcing part of the investment that we are doing in terms of intellectual property. Um, the second thing that I want to discuss is actually the contribution that we make also to other open source projects. So we not only innovate, for our own programming languages, we are actually contributing also to other open source projects that are not led by Microsoft. Um, here it, we said that we have committed to 8,000 non-Microsoft projects. We also collaborate with foundations like Linux Foundation. We contribute actively to the Linux kernel. Uh, so we are one of the first contributor in the Linux kernel. Uh, and I know that for the ones who have been in, in IT for years, it's, it, sounds, uh, it sounds really hard, but we, we are definitely active in this. Uh, and then the third one would be enable. Uh, we know that the, the world of IT is moving really fast. Um, and the student that I was uh, 14 years ago is obviously different than the one. I'm not a student anymore, uh, although my hair are always messy. But, <laughs> uh, but it's not the same. Uh, at that time, 14 years ago, we had to code everything ourselves. It was kind of difficult, so I had to actually find students, friends who, who could help me developing and, and create uh, lines of code. Uh, here, the world is completely different. If you have an ID, if you have the new startup that could become the new uh, Facebook or the new Netflix or whichever, uh, it's, it's actually easy. You don't have any investment to make. You, you can just grab... Some, some cloud service like Azure and, and build your ID and then 
use a framework that is open source or not, it's up to you, and then you deploy, and then if the success is there, uh, you can just have an elasticity in the way you handle the request. So it's really easier than 15 years ago in terms of IT. You just have to have the right IDs. Um, and we know that the world is changing for that, so uh, we have also, uh, we are also making sure that higher ed institutions, students, IT services in the different education institutions and universities can follow that, that rhythm because this is really fast. Um, so what we did is that we, we have a, a, a website co called Microsoft Learn where anyone on the planet can just um, have these cloud skills or open source skills easily. So this is a, actually a challenge to all of you. Um, I'm, I'm level seven. I don't know what it means, but you are probably level zero. Uh, <laughs> so just catch me if you can. Um, you, you can just earn badges there and, and just, um, how can I say, speed up your skills in terms of Azure development and, and open source skills. Um, to summarize, it's as simple as one to three. If, if you want to do something with Azure or with open source, um, I will, again, take three examples that I have in mind when I work with universities and higher ed institutions. Innovate with the power of the cloud. It's super easy now to create a chatbot or to create something uh, where, they can, where students can interact with um, a query or a database of uh, frequently asked questions, for example. It takes five minutes to create that chatbot and then to have it spread across email, Facebook, Skype, Teams, whichever messaging platform that the students are using. Five minutes, really. Uh, so if you want to innovate uh, inside your uni university or higher ed institution, it's really easy. Just, just use the cloud and, and go for it. Second thing is uh, contribute. So um, there are a lot of projects and, and Erasmus Without Paper is one of them. Uh, there are a lot of projects where you just go ahead and, and contribute to any project you are involved in. And then you can actually enable your institution to achieve more. I'll take one example. Uh, you know, some institutions are going with their learning management system like Moodle or others. I don't know which one you are using. And then they, they face an issue that once it's really used, then the system goes down, which is terrible in terms of having teachers running away and saying, I don't use technology for the next 10 years. So if you want to have teachers with you, make sure that the IT infrastructure that you are putting in place will be stable and will be up to speed once it's getting used. So with, with the cloud, you, you could do all of this. Um, and thank you for your attention. And now I will give the, give the mic to you. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. So uh, there you have it from Microsoft. So I know many of you will not be IT developers and you won't, you won't see these things front end, but let me, let me try and give you uh, maybe an analogy. Imagine a world in which uh, documents or music or anything that you care to c consider that is a creative venture, uh, that people wrote little bits and put them in a place and said, you can use that little bit and you can make up your music or your story or your poetry or whatever. That's what open source is about. So open source says, I've written this bit of code and I'm very happy for you to use it. Uh, it's, it's a very simple idea. It's contrary to most of any other experience that you will have. People don't generally do that. Here's my snippet of poetry. Put it into your poem. People just don't do that, but coders do that. They share code, they make it open source, and they write it in such a way and document it so that you can understand it and use it. So the purpose of uh, this platform, which, thank you, timely the slide has gone up, uh, is that within this project, 
building really the first glimmers of the Open Source University Alliance. So coders from around the community saying, I've got some code, I'm prepared to share it, it's in a repository, it's stable in a repository, and it's gone through a process. Initially at the moment, it's human intervention by some of our colleagues from uh, Portugal, from Porto, so code is sent in, they check it, validate it, and then they put it up on the repository. And your IT people can then look and say, hey, that's a nice bit of code, that'll save me some time, I'll use that. Okay, so at the moment there are uh, three contributors and uh, four? Four. Ah, sorry. You see, gone up already. Uh, use my glasses. So we have uh, the University uh, of Porto here, and uh, the uh, second one is from. I can't see the name on that one. Okay. Yeah, then Th Thessalonica and uh, Bologna. So these uh, are all in the repository now. They've gone through the system. I can get very geeky with you and take you to the GitLab, but you probably get really bored with that, so we won't do that. Uh, but essentially, for your coders, they will be able to come here and say, you know, we always wanted that bit of code, but uh, we didn't have the time or the resource. We had just at the last panel people saying, well, if the commission give us money, well, if people can do this. This is where, as a community, we can all share code. We can all say, we've done this, we use this. That's part of the validation. The university's using it, they're giving it to you because they believe it's a valuable piece of code. And uh, you can then go away uh, and, uh, and use it or contribute. So as, uh, as we uh, discussed, uh, you, know, you, you innovate, you contribute, and then you validate. So there's a number of different codes here. Again, I won't go into all the details of them. Uh, we have somebody from the University of Thessalonica here might just say a few words about the contribution that they've made uh, and then I'm going to open it up for you to say anything you want. It's a good idea, we'd never thought about that, uh, we'd like to contribute, we'd like to understand more. But if I just hand over to my colleague from Thessalonica first. Hello, my name is Dimitris Daskopoulos. I, I'm Head of Services and Application Development at the IT Center of the University of Thessaloniki. We run a small team of 15 developers and we take care of most of the internal services for the university. We also support the local mobility office which is responsible for the services uh, around EWP and mobilities. When we were first approached by EUF a short time ago, I thought, what could we possibly have that would interest other universities in Europe? Um, what could we possibly share? A lot of our work is customized for the Greek language. Um, that's one thing, getting it internationalized. Another thing is um, getting the code ready to be reviewed by somebody else, somebody outside your organization. Those are two major blocks um, standing in the way. Uh, once I got over the initial uh, um, response, I thought, well, maybe um, taking the risk to open up and um, even offer something as a proposal for, for feedback by others, uh, just to get um, other institutions in line with what you're trying to do and maybe have useful comments on uh, solutions that could be done another way not even use your own work, but have comments on your work. So we decided to open up um, three, as, as a sample, three of our uh, projects. We did this in a very short time. Um, they're not ready, they're not for uh, uh, critical review, but um, we're welcoming any comments you have. I'll go over them shortly. Um, the first one is the obvious one. Uh, we're trying to join EWP and our local homegrown solution for interconnecting our local mobility system with EWP was uh, a good candidate project for this cause. Um, we weren't aware at the time if any other institutions were doing similar things and already we see that on the, the um, OSUA repository um, similar efforts are demonstrated. So we opened up our own solution uh, 
fairly modern approach with Node.js uh, architecture and uh, JavaScript codes interfacing with the EWP network. That could be something that any institution could uh, um, make good use of in the future to interconnect their own local systems. And the idea is to expose much of the API, not just a standard API, not just towards the outside network, the network outside your institution, but towards your local homegrown solution, a standardized API. Um, the second project was something we had worked uh, recently, which is the university class scheduling system. Um, it's available live online. You can uh, try it out. And if you use translation services on, on your browser, you should be able to see a, a fairly good view of um, all the courses offered and where they're uh, taught at the university level. And the code for this is offered um, open source on GitHub. It's Angular based, uh, front end, and the back end again is API based, which is something if you're willing to, you might be able to uh, tweak and make it work for your own university or compare to what services you have. And I'd certainly like to hear from you if anybody's interested in sharing ideas and um, similar projects. And the last one is um, something that we felt there was a need for and no solution for. Um, we used to a local Lime survey ins installation at our institution, which is a tool for making uh, open surveys to your campus groups. And it could be an official survey by the institution itself or open to groups um, within your university, smaller groups that want to do survey. What was lacking from the tool, which is a, an open source tool you can install on premises, what was lacking was uh, authentication using the local identity management solution of the school. So there was no real good way to make sure only authenticated members of your university could use the service. And that was a, a small plugin that we um, tweaked to make it work with um, modern SAML uh, authentication infrastructures. So these were the three projects. Um, a few comments, if I may, on um, IT and IT people. I hear the discussion today about um, doing away with all the manual work of the mobility offices and I realized that at another level, the analogy with IT people resolving the same problems over and over again at their own institutions is exactly the same. We're doing a lot of the manual work over and over again ourselves. Um, we're solving the same problems over and over again. And we tend to think, we like to think, maybe we, it's a good excuse, that uh, we're solving our own problem, which is not the same as the one of the institution next door, um, which is probably not true. We don't really know what the processes at the institution next door are. And once we start sharing, we'll probably realize that, realize that we're solving the exact same problem. We're imposing our own um, requirements, which are not necessarily so strict as we think. And seeing the decisions made by other institutions next door, we might be able to realize that common work uh, done by so many people around Europe and around the world could be at the center, could be contributed towards a, a common goal. Um, and IT people are, you know, the stereotype, the people that work behind closed doors and like to work on their own. Uh, that may be true, but it's also true that IT people like to affect uh, uh, large numbers of people around them through their work. And open source is a way for them to really go out and affect large communities of people. I'd like to see uh, more of us do this kind of work and hope to get the code coming in the next few months. Thank you.
Thank you for that. That, that exactly sta states what, uh, what we're about. So there are four pieces there now. There are how many participants here? Roughly? Hmm? Okay, so this is the start. You may not be technical. You may not understand some of what's being said here, but I'm sure you understand sharing. And you understand that if we're a university community across the whole globe and we're going to start sharing code to make better services across the whole of the university sector, then I think you can understand that. So you can take that message back and you can say to your university, hey, there's this start. There are four brave institutions that have submitted code and uh, open to scrutiny, open to question, open to debate, even offering you to question scrutiny and debate because they want to know how, how it works, how it works for you, how it might change things. Go away, see who, who wants to put code in from your institutions. See if they feel like they'd like to share some code and they'd like to contribute to this. This, this could be a massive thing in a year's time. There could be a huge amount of code in there, but it requires the community to want to do that, to want to share. So we can press the button on the commission and say, please give us more money, or we can find a radical, really nice solution a solution that really is embedded in the concept of universities, that we believe in community and we believe in sharing. And we can create this, uh, this alliance, this coding alliance that gives us all value and benefit. Okay, so I really urge you to do that. What I want to do now is, because we've got some time, uh, I want to just ask you, there may be technical people here who would like to comment, but if you're not technical, so what would you want this to deliver you? What things do you think you don't have that you would like to have? So I just give it to the floor for any comment. Anybody? Systems that you don't think you have at the moment. Do we have one there? Ah, okay. Sorry, I didn't see you there. I don't, okay. Do we have a mic? We can... Do a sprint. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Too late. Now you've got a microphone okay. as well. Thank you. My name is Mary May. I'm from the National Agency in Ireland for Erasmus+. Plus. This is very interesting and something that we as a national agency will send out to our institutions, but with code, and I've just spent the last two years learning to be a data analyst, so this is quite interesting. But in, we can't actually see what's in this. Is the name of the person that write the, wrote the code there so that if my institution is interested in this piece of code but maybe runs into difficulty, because that's what coders do, they share, but they also kind of help each other out when code goes wrong and stuff like that. So I'm wondering, is that in there? So that if someone comes back to the national agency and says, my IT um, department really like this, they like the connector bit, but we've run into difficulties. Who, you know, who okay. actually wrote I the mean, code? I'll, I'll answer generally, and, and I think yeah. it, will, uh, it will align with what as long as you can say. These are all on repositories, so I think everyone is on GitHub. GitHub has mechanisms for communicating and commenting. So I believe you want to say in your specific case? participate on the projects. Um, you can also uh, check out our official website at the university and get in touch with the developer team or myself. Yeah, sorry, I, I tried to avoid all that techie stuff. Uh, but if you go into any one of these, then they are, they are actually takes you to GitHub. And you, you've got issue trackers. You can use that in any way you wish. It may not tell you a human's name. They may not want to be stalked. But uh, you definitely have access to that code and issue tracker. And the community would be able to engage with that. So these are, these are the first ones. You can go in there. Your, your coders can go in there. And you can make comment today. If so wish. And when you put the oars there, then you'll get comment. And they might say, oh, I've found this, or you might do that. This is the sharing community. Okay? You never know how much tech to put in these things. Yes, I think there was a hand somewhere. 
Am I an illusion? So I'm, don't, don't, don't be shy. It's about what you think you might want and you don't have. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you just maybe anecdotally, uh, all those of you that feel the pain of working with the various spreadsheets and emails and things will understand this. But I, I've been in Erasmus since 86, but I very rarely had anything to do with that level of putting the data in. There were other people that did that. They told me it was painful, but I never really experienced it. But I set up a, a, a placement period uh, scheme for my, unit, my department where we would just place students in companies. First year, I had two students to place. It was quite easy. Actually, the second year, I had seven students. And I was staggered. Seven students on an Excel spreadsheet with any number of emails between the various companies and what did they send and what they not said. And I already felt the pain. The numbers don't need to be very big before it gets complex to manage it. I'll give you one other piece of information. I spent years evaluating ECTS labels. All right? The great and the good across Europe would submit three dossiers of three independent students demonstrating that the learning agreement, the host transcript, and the home transcript agreed. And they never did. Three dossiers from the great and the good who felt they ought to get the Erasmus label. And I can tell you, we stretched the imagination when we saw signatures where there weren't signatures, or we saw courses that could see the way through it. It's amazingly difficult to get it right unless you have well-designed systems. So everybody understands that. But if you, whatever you might want, this is the way that you might get it. So just if any, anybody wants to contribute? How do I do this? <laughs> you have to hand the microphone over now. Let's see. Thank you. Um, I'm Evelyn Renders from Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, I'm actually wondering, um, I think we all have the same needs for data management reports. So we do the same analysis, we try to see how many students do we send where, which contracts are actually depleted, how many students do we have left, how many students can we still send. Um, these are reports that uh, I generate um, from the data from our student information system. And um, yeah, I'm really curious if I can connect with other people, perhaps via this uh, platform, to see because if we can share the codes or the queries or the, the, yeah, the, the data analysis that we uh, want to make. So we can provide the right information at the right time to our bosses who want to put it in a year report or anything. Yeah. 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 No, it's it's an excellent example. I mean, you you can have the best database on the world, and you can say, I don't think you can say, but let's imagine you say every element of that database is correct. That would be a brave statement, mm -hmm. I can tell you. But let's imagine you say that. But every time you want to know something, you say to people, I wonder how many students did X, Y, and Z. What have I got to do? Ah, I've got to send a query to the planning department and that will go on their list of requests to query the database and I might get into the will do task list at some point. So, of course, many universities suffer the same problem and we have adopted a commercial system, Tableau, visualization and, and reporting tools, but it's costly and it doesn't work for everybody. So you're right, data analytics. So if anybody is doing that kind of thing and building bespoke services or services that give you reports, I'm sure that will be, everybody would like that. Because it, it, it's in there, but what do, what do I know? How do I know it? And you can think of, you can dream up all sorts of reports. It usually means asking somebody, will you run this query on the database? <sighs> Next March, maybe? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks. Any other contributions? Second floor? No. <laughs> okay. No, no more contributions. Well, I have, I have one more task that I need to do, and uh, that is that uh, by way of encouraging uh, institutions to uh, participate, participate. Ooh, I'm echo, huh? uh, we do have a, a little ceremony of awarding a prize to the uh, University of Porto, actually, for being the first institution to... Uh, put something on the repository, and somebody has oh, prepared, smashed, broken, sorry, <laughs> prepared the gift already, so uh, if uh, you would like to come forward from the University of Porto.
to get a photographer, so he's going for it. So, uh, Okay, so uh, I don't know if either of you wanted to make any last contributions to this. We seem to, to have drawn all the contributions from the floor. Is there anything more you wanted to say? No? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. So thank you to the panelists. <laughs> and thank you for your participation. I'll hand back over to Valer. Yes. So actually, the... The next session will be uh, moderated by Zhao, so, and we will have representatives from national agencies, and they will discuss um, Erasmus Rao paper from their point of view. So Zhao, once you're ready with your administration, <laughs> I can hand over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, Today we've heard from students, from IROs, from IT experts, and I think we've talked from the Commission, of course, among others, um, but we haven't heard from the national agencies. So I'd like to invite a few colleagues to join me on stage. Uh, Nicolette and Carly are already set up. I don't know if Mark is, is in the building. Come on over. I have a few questions for you. And um, fingers crossed that we can catch up a little bit. So we have three countries at this table. Um, we couldn't invite all 33 program countries. I would have loved to, but I'm not sure that uh, agenda would stretch. Uh, I'd simply ask each of you to say a few words about yourselves and why you think you ended up invited to this panel. <laughs> Well, hello everybody. My name is uh, Gerli Grauberg and I'm working for the National Agency in Estonia. And uh, obviously, as Estonia is uh, digitally very advanced, uh, I am uh, interested in the subject and to take uh, Erasmus without paper uh, on a different level, higher level as well. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Markus Sumank. I'm from the uh, National Agency for Higher Education in Germany, uh, German Academic Exchange Service. Um, it could be a reason I'm here because uh, we suffered a trauma from the mobility tool and ever since we've been in close, uh, in close cooperation with the Commission and also skeptical uh, before EWP started uh, and, and kept in touch with uh, Joao who listened to all our questions and this is how we, how we met and uh, so he became the face uh, uh, for the project uh, for us and we are very grateful that um, he came so far. Um, Joao, thank you. Good afternoon as well. Um, my name is Nicoleta Popa. I come from the Romanian uh, National Agency for Erasmus Plus. And I'm actually proud to be back in Ghent. Ten years ago, I was an Erasmus student here. So it's kind of uh, coming back home to, to the city and to this university that hosted me for my Erasmus Plus study mobility for five months. Um, and I am here uh, part of the panel because we've uh, tried to take some further steps into the direction of digitalization in Romania with a working group that I would like to, to share some information about and tell you uh, what is going on. Now, you can see this is a very good panel because the questions almost write themselves. One of the things I'd like to open the debate with is exactly the experience that we've had in Romania because We've often discussed among ourselves, uh, brainstorming meetings, working groups, how is it that we can start involving more our education institutions. So I think Nicolette has some experience in this respect. Maybe you care to add a few words about how this uh, approach has been working? Yes, well, um, it actually started as part of a national agencies meeting last year in December when we had a brainstorming uh, session 
and we discussed about how to support our universities and how to encourage them to use the tools to get familiarized with, uh, with what they work, how they work and what their purpose is. So one of the ideas was creating uh, groups of universities and encouraging them to, to use the tools because in our role as national agencies, we can do that. We can work with our universities and support them as much as we can. So what we did in Romania in September, uh, we launched this initiative, the first working group for digitalization, Erasmus uh, Going Digital. And um, we had a voluntary open call to any universities that, uh, that were interested to take part in it, especially IRO staff that deals with outgoing mobility and of course with preparing the learning agreements and, and everything. And we had uh, quite, uh, a, let's say, an appropriate interest from our universities. 14 universities joined this group. This is uh, somewhere around 20% of the universities that implement Erasmus Plus projects in Romania and that are very active in this sense. So this was a good first step to, to start with these numbers, uh, this number of universities. Uh, the activity of the group is, as you would expect, online. We discuss online, uh, we have email exchanges and so on. We receive support from, uh, from EUF, Joao, of course, and the team with guides that um, have been useful in uh, sharing with the universities and giving them guidance, explaining to them how the tools work and what they need to do to uh, access them. So uh, out of the three uh, scenarios that you saw earlier, we are focusing on the scenario with only working with the Erasmus dashboard, uh, online learning agreement and Erasmus Plus app. So the basic steps, okay? But we are taking maybe baby steps, but it's still, um, uh, let's say the appropriate uh, uh, steps to take at the moment. Um, what we plan to do is uh, the universities will use the tools, they will, um, they have already created the accounts and they ha have already um, started to become familiar with them. They will use it with a few of the students and by March next year, which is the, the planned, um, let's say, calendar of the group, we will have, uh, let's say, a, a deadline to report on the results we achieved so far. So we will look into uh, the their experience, of course, the real experience of universities using it, if there are any challenges, if there are any obstacles that we come across and how we, we of course, resolve all, the, all these uh, maybe issues. And the most important thing would be that the universities will work together, they will cooperate as part of the group, and later on, hopefully, they will share the experience with other universities and they will convince the others to also join this group and join the, the digitalization trend. And I will uh, close uh, with the idea that the European Commission shared, they shared it this morning and they shared it at the EAIE conference in Geneva earlier this year. The time to join the digital revolution is now. So this is what we try to do with this small group. It's a small step, but it's still a good step uh, forward. Thank you. And I understand that in Germany we're having quite a lot of discussion about what does digitization mean for the higher education sector. So how do you see what we are trying to achieve in EWP and in Erasmus in general? Does this dovetail well with the discussions that you're having in Bonn and beyond? Yeah, we have it on, uh, on several levels. Um, it's what, what we have uh, here in front of us today is about um, the administration side of, of Erasmus. Uh, but there is, of course, digitalization in the Bologna area, uh, which we have been discussing um, just two weeks ago. Um, we still have no clear concept about what blended learning will look like uh, when it might become part of Erasmus in the future, in a future program generation. And then there are, of course, numerous ways of uh, cooperating, uh, of cooperations between universities uh, that are being uh, conducted with digital means. So it depends always on, on what you look at. Uh, concerning uh, the digital preparation, so to say, uh, for mobility um, management, uh, we have a fragmented picture, I would say, um, because, because just from the roughly about 350 universities that are 
that are involved in uh, Erasmus in Germany, um, something between uh, 40 and 50 percent of them are smaller than 50 mobilities, uh, which is the threshold for using uh, external databases in private support. So from the administrational side of, uh, of, of it, uh, we still have uh, lots of discussion ongoing how we tackle this uh, and how we try to, to put this fragmented picture into like a whole scope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a few challenges ahead, and this is where I turn to Curly, because every time that anyone in my team has doubts about how you go digital, <laughs> usually the obvious answer is just ask someone in Estonia. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to ask you if your higher education institutions are ready for this change. We take mm -hmm. it for granted that is probably the case. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I will correct you later. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I, I do ask you, however, whether you feel that what is being done here, whether it meets needs and expectations. From your experience of working with your universities, is this something that you see fitting into you know, the question of doing more with less with regards to expanding mobility? Or would you recommend us to aim slightly elsewhere in terms of the impact that we're trying to bring about? No, I, I completely agree that this is a, this is a big step forward that, uh, that we're taking. And, um, well, Estonia is mostly advanced uh, in uh, digital advance in the public uh, sector. We have uh, e-residency, for example, e-voting and uh, e-health system. And I couldn't imagine my life without uh, being able to di sign uh, digitally documents wherever I am or access uh, my uh, medical data or perhaps even um, vote online. So, and the, the, the aim of all, all these uh, services is to make life easier, to make the services more accessible and to, to really save time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the EWP is aiming for exactly the same things. So it will, I believe, uh, really en enhance the, the program in the future. Brilliant. So it's important. Well, then let's get our hands dirty a little bit, because uh, as we've heard this morning, we have essentially two years to go until the new program. I think there's a very strong appeal for higher education institutions to get connected, to get involved, to connect their systems and the people that power them. Um, what does this mean in terms of what we have to consider regarding whether it's training requirements, whether it's other kinds of support that we might need to envisage? Um, we've heard the question of investment, We've heard about the Open Source Alliance. Clearly, there will be different tools and mechanisms, strategies to achieve um, what might seem like a daunting task because two years will go by very quickly indeed. Um, what are your advice, your concerns? How do you, what do you see as the critical success factors for the next steps to go well? And the question is really for all of you, whoever is brave enough to tackle it. <coughs> So, so for me, it's all about training. Uh, although this is uh, this, this can happen uh, in in whatever form, but uh, to uh, to have uh, something uh, that really uh, fits everyone will not be possible. So uh, we will try to uh, to separate these uh, these different uh, needs uh, by uh, by their goals and see who is prepared already. Uh, we have been seeing this uh, quite impressively this morning that those who work with certain databases. Uh, f mostly from the private sector, uh, they are well prepared if everything works fine, uh, and the rest uh, will follow. And, and uh, so we will, we will see to, to set up maybe really regional uh, approaches uh, combined with then uh, product, so to say, designed approaches, um, because uh, we're not very familiar with online formats. We use webinars and so on, but we do not do online conferences so far. So maybe this is uh, maybe this is the wrong approach. Still, we need to learn a lot because we are uh, not as digital as we would like to be um, in in quite many ways. And this is a public debate that we have currently in Germany go ongoing. Um, but uh, we, speaking of the the resources that you mentioned, I think that Erasmus has already uh, invested a lot, so to say. Uh, when you just look at the administration, um, the, the contributions that are that are being poured into the system, this is quite uh, numerous. Uh, in, in the German case, we have like 13% of organizational support of, of all the financial means that go into the mobility uh, management. Um, and I guess this is also a rate that you have in, in other countries. So this money is being used for 
the best of the quality of mobility projects. And this is, has been used already uh, to acquire database uh, to, uh, to maybe train and, uh, and hire more people who, do, who deal with this. So uh, we, we, have been, uh, we have been approaching already uh, this stage. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, this all came, so to say, with the sudden introduction of the mobility tool, and ever since we have been following that path, and it led to a, prof a professionalization uh, that, that is now uh, about to be concluded, so to say, with, uh, with uh, EWP when it really works. So when we have reached it, uh, it's, it's, it's like a pain that you forget, and then, uh, then you move on. Corporate sponsorship. <laughs> Well, when it comes to uh, what are the next steps we need to do, then uh, I think the most important is to really give out uh, a clear message what's uh, going to happen and when, because I think everybody is expecting it, and we have received uh, messages here today as well. And then uh, when the messages have been really received, then I think the most important is to start testing as, as much as possible, because the, the feedback is really needed. And uh, there might be technical issues which need to be solved, and uh, the technical team might not know them. Uh, so, as much we need to gather as much feedback as possible to to be able to make make it better. So, and I agree with Marcus. Training is is very important, and uh, when it comes to to support uh, support of uh, higher education institutions, then then I believe that the uh, integration process, especially those to those who have an uh, in-house system might be uh, quite uh, difficult and, and a costly procedure, so, so in the ideal world there would be uh, some kind of financial support as well for that. I also, I would think that um, we need to take into consideration the needs of our universities, uh, maybe at a country level, maybe at a European level, but still focus on, uh, on what they really, or what you really need depending on the size of the university, depending on the number of corporations and uh, the level of, of involvement that each of you have. Because we, of course, need to focus um, as it is planned and it has been for this project. You have those uh, three types of, uh, of cases where universities have their own systems, others do not use the system. So there is a big diversity within uh, our universities and we have to take that into consideration. So for a proper uh, preparation and uh, proper steps that we would take forward, we need to take into consideration their needs. Because I'm sure um, we will face, we will find out that many of you face challenges, um, human resources, financial resources, IT, and, and so on and so forth. So we need to look into that and see where the key um, support needs to, to be focused uh, mm -hmm. to. Well, I take comfort, or I'd like to try to take comfort on the fact that the project and the solutions were designed by universities themselves. So I hope that to some extent we've sought to cater to the needs on the ground. But um, when we see the type of universities that have contributed for the execution of the project, and also to some extent the profile of the colleagues that um, joined us at this event and others, one question that tends to, to, to pop up is whether we are doing enough to make sure that smaller institutions, which you've also mentioned in some of your interventions, can be brought on board quickly enough. Uh, in your experience, is that the case? Do, we, do you feel like we have developed sufficient, um, sufficiently fit for purpose solutions for those higher education institutions? Is that an area where we have to consider extra steps or special steps? Because we can't risk a digital divide in the new program, particularly not under the adding of inclusiveness. Well, I think uh, there is a solution uh, provided for each uh, type of, uh, or each university who use different uh, types of, uh, of systems. So there is uh, a solution for smaller institutions with, uh, with, if they don't have their own system, there is a solution for commercial system and there is a solution for an in-house system. And I think that, um, well, we should pay attention to all of those, uh, those options. And um, it might be that uh, for the smaller institutions, as they mostly do not have a commercial or an in-house system, 
it might be easier for them to, to adopt the Erasmus Plus dashboard. So, and this is the biggest part as well. It was 42%, if I remember correctly now. So, but so in, in that case, I, I might even think that uh, special attention should be paid to those, uh, those institutions who use their, their in-house system and who need to connect to the network because they would need more, more support. I'd rather like to, to have some of the uh, German colleagues here in the, in the room, uh, maybe they can step in uh, later in the discussion because we have really literally have all types of, of colleagues here. I was surprised in the morning to see, uh, starting with arts and music, uh, rather small universities uh, of uh, arts and music to uh, really the biggest ones that we have in Germany. The, the whole scale is here. Uh, which is a good sign. Uh, if we can really broaden this uh, and and reach out for, uh, for so to say, all of them uh, who, who would benefit from such a solution, we don't know. Uh, an important aspect or a step uh, on the way would, of course, be to see uh, what becomes mandatory and what not. This is like, if, if I'm not starting too, too quickly with this, but this is the standard question that we get to hear. Um, uh, do we need to use this? Uh, when do we need to use this? Uh, what do we need to do to get there? Otherwise, it, it doesn't approach them quickly enough or it, it doesn't become relevant. Uh, uh, maybe also um, to address uh, the hierarchy uh, in their houses to say, uh, we need to use it, this is why you need to, we need your support, we need more resources and so on. Um, so so it's, it's both bottom up and top down uh, what, what we need to address. And um, the development of the, um, of the solution so far in this bottom-up way is, of course, the best thing that you could do. And, and, and you, uh, uh, like I said this morning, it was, for me, it was really impressive to see that it all worked and that you have been considering so much uh, already today and that we do not need to, uh, to just write uh, uh, IT tickets about things that don't work uh, for years and years before we get somewhere. Um, so we, we, we already started, uh, or we, we will start on a different level, but to involve more people it needs then, and to, to get over a certain uh, border, so to say, or a limitation, uh, you need to make things mandatory gradually. Uh, in, in a good sense, this could, this could be a, a way of mainstreaming, uh, really a good sense of mainstreaming. Um, so I would, uh, I would plea for, uh, for having those, those two things uh, uh, together. Coming together. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to jump over Nicolette and then I'll give you the word first because Marcus touched upon the elephant in the room. I get that question a lot. I go to a lot of conferences, I try to explain what we're doing, and there's always someone either in the plenary or in the corridor or in the coffee break that walks up to me and says, well, it's the last day that I can stick to my system and not bother with any of this. And I think it's a policy question at the art of it, and I think it goes also to the art of the next program. Now, we've touched upon that in the previous panel with vice rectors. Um, in your experience, until when do you think we have to wait until this administration culture moves into the digital era? Is it 2021? Might it be a bit later than that? Well, what's your feeling on that? And I'll give the floor to Nicoletta first, since mm -hmm. so far that I've cut her a little bit short. Sorry for that. Well, maybe the, the most obvious deadline would be the beginning of the new program so that we start fresh, we start with something new. Of course, this will mean that um, enough time will be, will be important and needed to test and make sure that we have something that is stable and that is feasible and that covers um, the needs and everything that universities require. Um, there's not much time left, indeed, exactly. and we, we have a lot of work to do but maybe start with small steps. Maybe the implementation will be done gradually. We don't have to start with everything at the same time. We will have to see uh, how it is uh, in the best way. But I really think the future program is. <laughs> well, it depends how you look at it, right? If we have the glass full or uh, half full or half empty, I think we have enough time. So if it's, if it's half full, and uh, I, uh, I agree with, uh, with Nicoletta as well in what she said. Um, the uh, first time point would be the beginning of the, of the new program, but uh, changing into a, a digital mindset is a, is a very long process because many countries are on different pathways uh, 
uh, what it, concerning digitalization in their countries. So there might be unexpected obstacles on the way as well. But we need to start from somewhere, and in this point I, I agree with Marcus. Uh, we should or, or should consider making an online learning agreement uh, and perhaps even inter-institutional agreements uh, mandatory uh, from the beginning of the, of the new program. Because if uh, we can indeed involve more uh, institutions into the process then, and uh, it will create less double work later on because everybody would be using the system at the same time. So that would be the mo most efficient. But uh, in the long run, it will take a longer time. And uh, I hope that uh, we will not stop with those two things, the OLA and interinstitutional agreements. We will go and develop it uh, further on. We'll add more things there, like transcript of records, nominations, and, and so on. So I hope that will be the future. Yeah, it's, um, it's all about added value, and uh, the IIA gives added value. Um, that's, uh, that was very clear in the morning um, when uh, Matthias Bücken uh, presented uh, this, this part. Um, I would rather start a little earlier than the new program generation when I remember, and I'm sorry to, to, to become historic again, uh, I've been on this for too long and I hated people who were always uh, talking about the history of Erasmus when I, when I entered the program, but still. Uh, in 2013, we had a new uh, mobility tool um, uh, being introduced uh, because the co uh, colleagues rightly said in the development team that uh, we, we need to introduce it before uh, the start of the new program generation to avoid a cluster. And what we received was then the first version of the mobility tool and then a new version of the mobility tool at the same time with Erasmus Plus and that was a cluster. So we should avoid such a situation. And um, the, the, the one, of, one of the many upsides of EWP is of course the, the, the modular character. So we can pick out or everyone could pick out uh, what, what serves their needs best. Uh, the IIA is of course something very convenient for, or could be very convenient for, uh, to prepare for uh, the higher education institutions and everyone involved, but we shouldn't, shouldn't forget about the students. Um, uh, and this would be my, my main point. Um, if, if you uh, introduce an online learning agreement, there should be no alternative and normal workarounds. Uh, everyone will hate me for this, uh, but it's, uh, I really think this is so important to have something convenient and not uh, for, for the participants and, and not all this ordeal that we have today. Um, because uh, when we try to uh, make administration better and when we try to also uh, keep the level of quality, because this is what it is about, I think it's qualitative administration, it's not bureaucracy, that's something else. Um, then, uh, then we would, uh, th then we would really have a gain, and the gain could be to to focus uh, to to not only have uh, better data and, and easier uh, management of the program, but we would have a gain by by getting the resources right again uh, where they belong. They belong to uh, make the program more inclusive, and I think this is where the where the two things meet. Um, uh, we, uh, we want easier administration, we want to become more inclusive in the n next generation of programs, we have to. Uh, we have to reach out for groups we don't, we don't reach out to today or we don't, we don't know yet, uh, we don't talk to yet on the one hand and at the other ha on the other hand we would like to of course raise numbers uh, to become also politically visible but this is just an effect. And so uh, EWP could be a means to uh, a different end uh, and to, to have with the continuity and the, uh, and the uh, architecture of the program uh, really the resources right and, and leave the desks and the, the desktops uh, uh, where they are and, and then leave regularly the office to, to talk to participants again because this is a, a bit what um, my impression is what, what we lost on the way uh, when, uh, when dealing with Erasmus Plus. Thank you. I, I'm probably not supposed to make comments as a moderator, but um, <laughs> I've been quite involved in this and other digitization projects, and I, I can't resist uh, corroborating what you just said about added value and economies of scale. Uh, when we've tested the online learning agreement with a group of around 30 universities and uh, 30 international offices, uh, one of the main findings is that um, the efficiency gains that we could add were wasted by the fact that they had to maintain parallel workflows. 
Which is why the question of what is mandatory and what isn't, I think, is also so important to get right from a policy viewpoint. Now, I think this is a good time to open the floor for questions. I suppose that some of what has been said here might uh, you know, now be curious to better understand what you can expect from your national agency, what you desire in the way of next steps and implementation. So if you have any brave volunteers that would care to join the conversation. Aha, thank you, Frederick. Um, my name is Frederick de Decker. I'm the head of the International Office of this university, Kent University. Um, I think indeed one of the important issues that has been mentioned is these small scale institutions, or rather the institutions that don't have a lot of mobility uh, within the Erasmus program or even uh, outside the Erasmus programs. And I was wondering, do you as national agencies have any concrete ideas about how to drag these into uh, let's say the whole setup of, of EWP, um, you've mentioned that indeed the, the dashboard could be a way out, but that would still need training and uh, support for these. So do you have any concrete ideas about that, that, that also the, the institutions can take home and can also ask from their national agencies? Well, I think that one option is, uh, right now we have the uh, uh, competence center, which is a very good thing. Their uh, smaller institutions will get uh, a lot of support, I believe. And uh, the second uh, good uh, thing to do would be uh, what Nicoletta did as well, or is doing in, in Romania, to just uh, that national agencies would uh, get together, some of their universities, may them be the, uh, the smaller ones, and uh, just train them on, on site or online, provide them uh, um, access to, to, or do it like step by step together with them, all, all the procedures, and, uh, and be there and provide information if, if necessary. So these would be the two, two things I would think are, are the most important. I hope that's answered some part of your question. The idea of, the, of these working groups that we can already start, as, as it's happening right now in Romania, uh, the idea was shared with other national agencies just a few weeks ago during our, one of our meetings um, here in, well, not here, in Brussels, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and many NAs, many agencies were interested in developing this idea and creating and trying, trying it out in their countries. So hopefully we will see some more initiatives around, uh, around our countries in, in the future months. But I would add to this because it's important to, to address the needs of small universities as well as big universities because um, it's maybe one of the ways the Erasmus Plus program is inclusive to address, you know, to help and support and involve small universities as well. And this is, I think, also a target for national agencies trying each year to attract them to um, apply for the Erasmus Plus Charter and then apply for mobility projects and so on and so forth. So maybe one of the ways uh, is, of course, training, pairing them up with other universities that have some more experience, some more insight that they can guide the smaller universities into into teaching them, into explaining, into sharing experiences with, with them. This would also, I think, would be useful. Thank you. Any more questions from the floor? I see a colleague over there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marianne Reis from the Irish National Agency. I don't want to add any sort of pessimism, but it's more the reality, as Marcus rightly pointed, the question of the mobility tool and all the issues that we had. And I mean, considering the smaller institutions, but not just the smaller institutions, that uh, the previous questions, previous question uh, brought to our attention. But the question of, for example, with the mobility tool, we have 
the national agencies have a tool for those that don't know, know that we can report then whatever queries you have, whatever problems you have, we can report that to the commission and it's a centralized point. My concern as a national agency then, uh, well, first of all, to congratulate the whole project is not a critique to, to, a critique to the project itself, but how uh, would the project envisage something like that? A center, I don't know the competence center, but any issues like the IMT uh, platform where we can report that? Because I think my main concern is not even the smaller institutions which we have the access then to, to the dashboard, because the dashboard, I look at myself, it seems pretty straightforward. I think then how can we on the, the role of DNA that we do not, do not have access to that dashboard, we do not control at any level even to give access to this dashboard, how can we assist, for example, bigger institutions that have move on or mobility online that they come to us? Because although we are not uh, involved in, in directly with it, the queries come to us is a concern of ours. Uh, on top of that, I think I had another question, but anyway, if it comes to mind, but it's mainly that, that kind of how how is that how that going to be dealt with, the queries for the questions of synchronization or reporting, all of them. Ah, I remember the question. The question is, on the question of the dashboard, I, I saw that uh, the institution can go there and register their own institution. What would happen if there is a, a duplicate of that registration, as it was in the participant portal in the cases that someone in the institution register create a pick number and someone else will come and create another pick number or overwrite that. So what is the mechanism that is in place in the dashboard for any duplication of registration and who decides the hierarchy of who is going to register the institution? Sorry if it was too long. I think that question is for me actually, so uh, I'll try to address it as swiftly as I can, but thank you, Marianne. Um, I would answer in two levels. Uh, I think it touches upon the role of national agencies and how this infrastructure feeds with the support mechanisms that are in place. And a few weeks ago, we started a discussion with the Commission and with some national agencies about uh, whether you'd be the ideal, ideally positioned to regulate access to the network. Insofar, there needs to be a vetting mechanism, and uh, I don't think it's upon the project to to take that responsibility. You are the con point of contact, as you've noted. So that's something that we will be working out throughout 2019. And with regards to the dashboard, uh, we've also been discussing since a few months that we hope that in the near future, we don't have to validate dashboard accounts. Currently, that's a manual procedure, so that's how we guarantee that there are no duplicates. But um, we are still working on the plan that um, sometime soon, an our education institution can log into the dashboard with the same set of credentials as they use to access the mobility tool by harmonizing the identity management systems between those two um, tools. So these are very pragmatic answers. I, I think we can find solutions uh, to address these needs. As a project, there is only so much infrastructure that we can put in place that connects automatically with the framework that exists at a more official, even legal level. Um, but that, I think, will be part of the transition plan into making this embedding uh, what has been produced into the structure of the Erasmus program. If any of you wants to correct me or compliment, please be my guest. Or else I think we'd have time for maybe a third question, if there is one. In the absence of further questions, and if I don't I, miss... Ah, I have a very practical one. I'm sorry to, to bother you again with this one. Do uh, participants from your countries need original stamps and signature on their mobility agreement, or do you accept scanned copies? Very simple, yes or no. Yeah, yeah we are in a populist world. Um, uh, learning agreements are officially uh, uh, to, be, to be signed digitally, but, but then the question for me is what's digital? So there are so many different ways of, sorry. So, uh, so can I just copies for the staff mobility agreements for people in this room, do you accept it? Once again, um, just... Do, do you accept scanned copies of signatures and stamps? That's what I just said. We don't need stamps in our case. Uh, digital signatures are fine, but digital could, digital could mean today, as in some countries, in use QR codes 
or in others it's really a, an original signature uh, scanned and then put into a document. But for the learning agreement it's fine. Uh, for a grant agreement, uh, since it's about money, you need original signatures still. Um, so this is the divide that we still have and it's part of the program. And this is also, it, it's being even put down into, uh, into what we call the Guide for National Agencies, so it's official. Okay, but I remember that you said for the learning agreement, for, for the, the agreement for the participants here, you don't need an original signature. A scanned signature is enough. Thank you. All right, I think we're already in posing. Thank you, Paul, it's a, it's a very important question. Uh, we're already in posing slightly under the time slot of the next panel, so I'll just wrap up by asking to each of you, you know, Let's take a glass half full approach. I think today we have reasons to be slightly optimistic about the future. If there's one thing that you want to happen in the next two years, what would be in the top of your wish list? Well, I would say that the most important, my wish would be to have as many institutions as possible to test this and, and give feedback. Uh, this is the only way we can go forward. We can. Uh, um, affect each other and uh, give positive uh, feedback and uh, negative feedback, uh, teach each other. Uh, the more of us who are doing this, the more successful it will be. And then we would be ready by, by 2021 as well. Um, I would like to have uh, the proper training and the proper preparation for this at the level of universities, at the level of agencies, in order to be able to multiply you know, the results and to multiply the, the guidance and, and everything. So this way we should be prepared for what's next to come. When using solutions like the online learning agreement and, and already making them uh, a reality today, then uh, think of uh, the participants, the students uh, in most cases to uh, to not have them fill out the same thing a couple of times to have uh, a, a more convenient solution uh, on, on uh, the level of a higher education institution and make, uh, make uh, students fill out multiple things. Um, this, is, th this does not add to the simplicity of a solution such as EWP and uh, it should be simpler on all levels in the best of cases. All right. Thank you all very much indeed. And uh, I think it's extremely important. I would have loved to have more national agencies and more time to go deeper into the practicalities of the roles and what lies out of us. But thank you all very much for joining us. Really thank good. you. Yes, I would like to invite Frederik, um, who is the moderator of the next session, to come forward and also the panel members um, who have been invited to join this because we're now going to look at the situation outside er Erasmus worldwide, but also from the point of view, for example, of Switzerland. Frederik and all the others, you have the floor. Good afternoon also on my behalf. This will be the last panel session, so bear with me for another three quarters of an hour. And if you allow me, I will first abuse the opportunity I have been given to moderate this session um, as head of the International Relations Office of Ghent University, as you've heard, one of the initiators of the Erasmus Without Paper project, um, to share with you that I feel today very proud and I hope you understand why because what we've seen today I think was very impressive and I would like to sincerely thank my colleagues uh, Valer and Paul but also the colleagues from the IT department that have heavily been involved for all the work they've done and also the colleagues in the office for preparing this meeting and uh, having it run smoothly and also I would like to thank the partners in the EVP project for uh, having 
gone all this way together with them. I think uh, another round of applause is uh, well deserved for what these colleagues have done here, Valer, Paul, and all the others. Thank you. But that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I will uh, be discussing together with you, with these esteemed panelists that came, and that's, it explains why we have the panel here now at four o'clock in the afternoon, that gives our Chinese and American colleague more or less the feeling that they can be awake uh, already now. Um, so, uh, do, who have traveled here, especially, especially today, to come and join us here. Um, to discuss the potential, the possibilities of what we've been discussing here this morning and afternoon beyond the European borders. Because it has been said a couple of times throughout the day that it doesn't or it shouldn't stop at the borders of Europe and it shouldn't be restricted to the Erasmus program. It's called Erasmus without paper, but I think in the end what we're looking for is international mobility without paper. And that's why I think it's very important that we have these people uh, with their own views. And I will briefly introduce them to you. Um, and I will start with the only female representative in our panel, um, Eloise Perrin. She does not come from outside of Europe, but she represents a country that's not part of the Erasmus programs. Um, Eloise is from the Swiss National Agency for exchange and mobility with the beautiful name Movicia. Um, and as you know, Switzerland is not part of the uh, Erasmus Plus program. And so that gives Eloise a kind of interesting insider outsider view because they have been part of the program, now they are no longer. So I'm really looking forward to her contribution. Sitting um, at the right for you is Chen Wen Jun, we can call him Edward who's the project manager of international promotion, uh, of the international promotion department of CHISIC. CHISIC is the China Higher Education Student Information and Career Service Center. Uh, that's an authoritative institution directly under the Chinese Ministry of Education. And they are specialized in information service and career guidance for students of higher education institutions for all Chinese universities. So imagine what kind of work they're doing there. Another overseas colleague we presented here is Ricardo Torres, Rick, from the US National Student Clearinghouse and uh, is also a member of the board of directors of the Groningen Declaration. You have heard reference to that before as well. Uh, the Clearinghouse is a non-profit and non-governmental organization and the leading provider in the US for educational reporting, data exchange, verification and research. Uh, services. And I'm glad that uh, indeed uh, he can also share with us together with Victoriano about the Groningen Declaration, uh, a network that seeks common ground in best serving the academic and professional mobility needs of citizens worldwide. And as I said, uh, Victoriano is also Victoriano Giralt from um, who is the Chief Information Officer of the University of Malaga, is also uh, very close to the Groningen Declaration Network where he served as president um, a few, for, for, uh, a few year, uh, up till uh, last year. And, and so um, Malaga, the university he's representing, is becoming more and more a reference point for universities in Spain, also in terms of digitization. So he can share his vast experience with this uh, topic with all of us here this afternoon. I will first ask the four representatives to give a brief statement and Zhao has finished off with uh, that question for his panelists uh, in the, at the panel before and I would like uh, the four panelists here to share with us already now their ambitions, their dreams, their wishes, their desires for the future but also possible uh, obstacles and solutions around this uh, with, of course, a link to Erasmus without paper, with the topic we discussion, with the uh, possibility of exchanging data all around the globe. Um, can I start with you, Edward? Thank you. Uh, I believe reduce cost and improve efficiency is always the theme. 
Chessex data collection from 3.5 inch floppy disk submission to CD room to UK online uploading. Benefit from the MOE's initiative and positive feedbacks from the provinces and universities, we can integrate the whole nation's data. However, all parties involved in Rasmus project are almost all independent countries, and they, uh, and they comply with the common vision and purpose, comply with the unified standards to enhance student mobility. And I believe such collaboration and spontaneous uh, working are admirable and deserving praise. I've read a book called Connectography. It affirmed the great contribution of going digital. It said that the digitalization of the air cargo documents can save 12 billion US dollars per year and can eliminate almost all air cargo delays caused by document errors. Therefore, I think the, the exchange of digital student data can also reduce the expenditure and uh, lower the error rate. And this year in China, Chessic has taken the lead in achieving electronic transcript verification with Tsinghua University. The students can apply for the transcript on a remote basis and the recipient can verify the e-signature via the Adobe Reader or visit Chessic's website. And our IT team is also working on the image acquisition function of our app aiming at the postgraduate candidate who cannot confirm at the prescribed site so that they can complete it at home. And these are complied with our philosophy of using technology to changing and improving things. And we have also opened the Chessie Connect CE channel since 2014. And in North America, we have connections with the College Net, uh, NSC, West, etc. Last year, we have transmitted more than 3,000 verified documents to North America. And the figure is keep growing. This year, the figure is already exceeds 5,000. And thanks to the GDN in bringing shared concepts and mutual trust in making such collaboration possible. And in Europe, uh, we provide consultancy and cooperate with NICNARIX, universities, and embassies. Our collaboration with DUO has enabled 11 Dutch universities receiving students' documents in a safe, efficient, and paperless way. In the future, <coughs> Chesic also plans to join MREX to strengthen our ties with Europe. Thank you very much, and thank you for bringing up this very important uh, element of how all that we have been discussing here today can also have a, a huge economic impact. And I think this is something that we could take further during the discussions. Eloise, um, the Swiss specific position gives you, as I said, a bit of an insider outsider view. Can you share your ideas uh, with us about how you see Switzerland getting involved in? topics like Erasmus without paper. Yes. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be here and thank you for inviting Switzerland to this uh, discussion. So as we hear and uh, as we maybe know, Switzerland uh, since 2014 has been downgraded as a partner country in Erasmus Plus. Uh, the guaranteed um, for outgoing and incoming, uh, such as the Swiss participation in uh, to the uh, 
to the strategic partnerships and the knowledge alliances. But this situation is not optimal, and then our goal, I mean, our ambitious target is really to to be part of this adventure. So we would like to take the train with you. Um, but in worst case scenario, I mean, if Switzerland stays uh, out from uh, the European country, uh, the European program, sorry, uh, we would like to say that we are really, we would be pleased to collaborate with you with these digital tools uh, and to be tested as a non-EU country. And also, uh, for us, uh, technology is great, but it shouldn't be a barrier uh, for mobilities between Europe and Switzerland. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you for this very positive uh, prospect for the future cooperation between uh, EU and, and Switzerland. Rick, um, within the clearinghouse, you have a vast experience of having all universities or a lot of universities working together and this is something that we've heard throughout today a couple of times as well we we don't want to leave a university behind so I'm uh, also very curious uh, to hear your ideas about uh, the US perspective and how we can learn from that and how we can cooperate in the future uh, well thank you and I also want to congratulate the uh, Erasmus uh, without papers team just a tremendous accomplishment what I saw this morning uh, was fantastic well thought out and uh, a great starting point um, you know I'll I had a set of talking points I was going to uh, go through and then as I watched the presentation and heard the conversations today it shifted and what became really apparent to me um, and I'll share this with you in terms of an ambitious goal and target Right? What you're really offering students is to be served better through a business process improvement in the form of a technical disruption to a manual process, paper-driven process. And what you're actually offering administrators and what you're trying to prove is that you're going to have privacy, transparency, and security in those transactions and that they can be trusted. Trust is something I didn't hear spoken at all today. And it is actually the linchpin that I think will make this work. If the students trust it, if the administrators trust it, if the national agencies trust it, then you can begin to have a very powerful use case, aside from just the cost savings. And uh, just as a quick aside on the confidence, I would suggest that you actually create a worksheet that looks at work time required to process the different documents that you have, how many euros it takes to process these things, what the mailing cost is, and every institution can look at that spreadsheet and calculate what their costs are. Now, why am I making that suggestion? Well, what's really interesting is that the Clearinghouse was formed in 25 years ago because students and administrators were suffering over a paper-driven process that was tied to federal student loans, which 50% of the U.S. students have student loans. The paper trail and the paperwork required to figure out you know, whether a student could still have their loans deferred was costing millions of dollars and it, it, a lot of wasted time. So higher education formed our company. We were a nonprofit, and it was formed by the institutions. They built the processes. They said, this is how it's going to work. And over the 25 years, it has expanded, but the similarities are very, you know, you, you can't, they're unmistakable, which is what really um, had me change my talking points. We started with four schools in 1993 and a pilot. Tested it, tested it, worked it, tested it 
Today, we have 98% of the enrollment of the country coming into our system, and that is substantial. Now, here's the thing about all institutions versus, you know, how many can you, you know, really work with. There are lots of institutions that have one student that ha may have a student loan. Mm -hmm. They're not signing up to go through a process. They're, there's a different process they can go through. So 77% of the 5,000 institutions in the United States uh, that work with Title IV, which is the student loans, submit data to the clearinghouse, and they enroll 98% of the students of the country. So be realistic. The smaller schools need a lot of help, right, to come up the ramp. And if you are going to be inclusive, you're going to need to really take those smaller schools into account. We receive data once a month from these schools, and in some cases, they are comma-delimited files. They're not XML, they come through secure pipes, but the schools don't have the technical capability. These are colleges and universities, right, to, to make this happen. So my point here is to actually help, to be the last session, and I'll end with this point about inspiring to aspire to where you could go. From four institutions, we serve 3,700. From a very small set of transactions, last year we did 1.4 billion transactions on behalf of educational institutions. The cost savings is about 870 to 900 million dollars a year. Now, why do I give you those numbers? You know what's really interesting? I looked up some numbers. The EU 28 in 2015, the enrollment was 19.5 million, including short cycle tertiary. You know what the enrollment was in the US? 19.3 million. <laughs> They're about the same size. I'll call it the US 53. We had like 50 states plus three uh, territories and the EU 28. So you have to start small. But what can happen over time if you do this right and build with trust and show that it works could be beyond what you can envision even now. It, but it's a brilliant starting point. Thank you very much for uh, this hopeful message for the future. I think, Victoriano, this must make you feel very happy because, as we've heard this morning, you're um, one of the founding fathers of this whole IG. And um, do you think that we have indeed accomplished and, and are ready f for a future like we've heard depicted uh, by Rick? Thank you, Frederick. Thank you for having me here. I don't know exactly why you decided to have me here, because I tend to be the, the one saying strange things. I've been floating this morning when I saw the demo working after so much time and effort. So, because this started long, long, long time ago. So seeing it working, wow. But then, you ask me for the view for the future. Well, I'd like that next year, in the closing conference of the EWP 2.0 project, all institutions here will be connected to the network. You see, it's easy. Code is available. So go grab your geek or your, uh, your IT guy and say, oh, grab the code, use it. Or go to one of those commercials that are already connected, if you have the money. So, so, so how many of you would say we are going to do that? <laughs> okay, you still have to Great. do some convincing uh, work <laughs> there. Great. And then I, I was happy to hear Vanessa saying this morning that we are going uh, ahead and I've heard nice things because I, I tend to say that, well, we talk a lot about digital transformation. But then I have another word for this. Uh, it's electrification. Mm. What we have done is we have electrified the Erasmus paper process. We have transformed the paper into electrons. But we have not changed a step of the complicated process. So now we have the tools. Now we have shown that we could do it. So now it's time to change the processes and make them person-centric so that will make us GDPR compliant, have them simplified so we can get more people enrolled, have reduced the barrier to entry so we can get those schools that uh, 
Greg was referring to. So we have a lot of work to do with the help of the Commission. So there's someone from Vanessa's uh, unit. I'm looking for you. Yeah. <laughs> so you go tell your boss that we have to keep working and reduce the burden on, so we can have you. We are suffering a reduction of people in our institutions. So if we reduce the bureaucratic burden in, in, on the people, they can serve the students instead of filling forms and repeating processes. The, the once and only principle was quoted here. They have one of the main uh, uh, use cases for the once and only principle of the EU is the educational case. But they didn't have a clue. I was with them and then they were amazed at, of what we're doing. So we have a lot of work to do. And we want you to do them, to help. Okay, thank you. Um, I, w I want to just follow up on that last point and ask to, to Rick and Edward. Um, we've, we've heard that we expect a lot from the European Commission, that we also expect a lot of support from the national agencies. Could you give us some tricks and advice on how indeed to get these key players on, on board so that they uh, bring about the, the message to the institutions? Because you, uh, as, as you said, Rick, uh, it was a demand from the institutions and you managed to get uh, the whole uh, high, or almost the whole higher education world involved in it. And, and you also have, I think, a, a, a lot of support within the different states you're active. And, and also in China, you represent uh, all these higher education institutions. So perhaps you could share us some ideas about how to get this huge involvement. Well. Um, I'll start and I'll just, uh, I'll suggest that the way a lot of these initiatives uh, get started in the U.S. and we, uh, there are things that we do not do well v at all and one of them that's changing very quickly is transcripts and, uh, and, and I'm going to come back to this point for that reason. The nature of the transcript is changing as we speak. What's included, uh, what's not going to be in there, they're going to add new elements uh, and so on. And getting agreement on standards is one of the biggest challenges that we have on what that needs to look like. Um, what we have found is that we need to get a coalition of the willing, right, to get together and actually be the first ones to move. And I don't know how it works in Europe, uh, but I can tell you that in the U.S., if you get a diverse enough group of willing participants at the university level, the others will watch, and if they trust it and they see it works, they will follow and they will come in. And that tends to be the trend, right? You have leaders, and then you have people that are watching, and then they'll go once they see the leaders have gone in. And I think you already stressed it, and you're stressing it again, and that's perhaps something that we have to take on board in the follow-up on uh, and the next year uh, in Erasmus Without Paper is indeed this trust issue and how can we make sure that uh, we test enough and that we can convince everybody that uh, what we promise to deliver will be delivered. I think that's a very good suggestion and a very good point to follow up to. Edward? I think my perspective is a little similar with Rick's. Uh, from take China, for example, the MOE take a big role in this kind of process, but MOE's initiative won't make it without the positive responses from the universities and provinces. And so the first is to make the pioneers take an example, take a first step to uh, be a model for the rest of the higher education institutions. Like the example I mentioned in what we do in transcript recently, the Tsinghua University is taking the lead in taking the e-transcript. Nowadays, Chessic verifies transcripts still takes a long time to verify with the institutions. But the pioneers like Tsinghua University seek the demand from the students, from the registrar and dean's office, and the, the foreign institutions in receiving those students. So they take this first step. And after this become a best practice, the other institutions will follow it then it becomes a trend and everybody gets in and then it works. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I would like to give the floor to you as well. Uh, you might also have specific questions about uh, how, how Erasmus without paper and what has been achieved so far and, and looking to the future, how it can open up to the rest of the world. So any issues you would like to address to these specialists here in the room? Are there any topics, Anthony? Thank you. If I could just add something on the question of transcript. I mean, as you saw in uh, the demonstration, uh, the transcript now in the EWP can be uh, received as data or received as a transcript that you might wish to see, a document, mm -hmm. PDF. Uh, but of course, all of us here, if we're representing uh, universities within the European, Univer University, European higher education area, uh, are of course issuing diploma supplements because we all promised to do that by 2015. I don't want to ask who is who isn't because I know there are still universities who don't issue the diploma supplement. Uh, that's one of the things that the UK did big time, I have to say. And in my university, we did that with an electronic uh, source. So now any student can uh, send any employer either the data or the PDF file of their transcript via the diploma supplement, or I can ask them for it if they want a reference. So those systems are in place, and anybody can do that. Uh, but so I think transcripts, which are gold, tra you know, transcripts are power. You know, students' transcript, this is verification. And I can see, uh, certainly through the... the uh, uh, the work that's been done internationally on the recognition, not of mobility students, but of a qualification. I want to accept a student to do a master's program, a PhD mm -hmm. program. What is their transcript? What is the verification? So you know, there's really enormous potentials there. But we, we all have the possibility to do that because the standardization is there through the diploma supplement. But I just think it needs the, uh, the desire, the will to do that and then to generate those things. Well, I think you already said, or you already nuanced uh, your issue that uh, standardization should be there, but perhaps isn't there in reality. Uh, Rick was also referring to, to that big shift taking place in the, in the US now in, in that standardization. And we do have about 30 years of experience with ECTS, which is also a kind of standard to some extent used by many, but certainly not all higher education institutions in Europe, and certainly not beyond the European border. So I, I think that's also an issue that I would like to bring uh, as a result of your remark, Anthony, to the panelists. Um, this standardization, how do we proceed with that? Because indeed, if we want to exchange data, we need to, to come to a kind of agreement on, on some standards at least. Uh, and uh, I've, I've learned from Rick uh, that uh, even in the US, the standards, uh, credit uh, hours and things like that are being uh, discussed, so let alone across the border. So what are your ideas about the ways ahead for this standardization? Well, I, I spoke with uh, a gentleman named Mike Sessa who runs the uh, P20 Education Standards Council in the United States, and now they're working in Australia, Canada, and looking at uh, Mexico to try to get, understand what a standardized transcript would look like coming that could support the interchange among these different regions. Um, I think that Europe has got to be in that discussion because I can tell I think the one thing that's going to happen is that edu as we all know, education is getting disrupted in a big way. Mm -hmm how it's delivered, technology is changing, the way uh, students are seeking their education so and their learning. Micro-credentials. Uh, Micro-credentials yeah. and being able yeah. to take courses from different places. So, you know, uh, if you build a platform based on today, you won't have the flexibility to understand mm. how it's evolving uh, at, right in front of us. Um, and that is what we're wrestling with in the yeah. United States right now, okay. is that the transcript is going through a major transformation, uh, and we're trying to figure out how to best fit that in. But I think it has to be done uh, in collaboration, uh, because when we exchange data, U.S. learners coming to Europe, European learners coming to the United States, uh, we want to make sure that there's, that there's, a, that, that there's a standard yeah. protocol to move that across. 
You wanted to respond to that as well, Victoriano? Well, I was going to sell <laughs> the Hroning Declaration. Yeah. Actually, uh, we, we are an umbrella organization yeah. for this to happen. Actually, uh, it was this guy Pe from PESC that knew about Erasmus when he came for, to, to one of the GDN meetings. And uh, people from our projects, the Erasmus Without Paper mm -hmm. or Embrex, have been heavily represented. So I think that the more people that join and, and follow our principles would be a, a great idea to come to a, a global standard. That it would not be easy, but I think it's achievable. Is that also something that is at stake in, in Switzerland or China, discussing more globalized standards? Well, in Switzerland, actually, we are using also ECTS, yeah. um, and because we were also fully part of uh, Erasmus Plus and LPP before, uh, between 2011, 2013, uh, we actually have pretty similar process, uh, which is already good if we are, if we come come back. Um, so yeah, the situation is maybe not the same as in USA. So, yeah. And for Chesic, we have our own XML standards, but as XML is not widespread in the application of the transmission, so we are also keep negotiating with our partners in foreign countries to try to find out a uh, unified standard that works for the both sides. So you say we need standards from the educational point of view, but you also need standards for the transmission of data, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, um, hello, uh, I'm uh, the coordinator of the European Student Code project. Uh, uh, if you remember what uh, uh, Vanessa de Biesenton said in the morning, uh, if we exchange data, we need uh, a student identifier compatible. And um, uh, in the European Student, student Code project, what we, dis we, we choose uh, as a student identifier, it's a, a universal system. We, we, we took the model from the IBAN, uh, International Bank Account Number, and we just use the local student identifiers. We add prefixes, the one for the institution and one for the country. And this is compatible worldwide. And it's why, for instance, in our project, the logo we choose uh, put the map of the EU, the map of the Bologna area, and the uh, globe for the rest of the world, because we, we were think, thinking from the beginning that we, we have to organize also the portability of data uh, uh, between uh, university in Europe and uh, from uh, the rest of the world. Okay, thank so. you for uh, that contribution. Any other um, questions or issues you would like to raise from the audience? There's one over there. Okay, so I'm from uh, Brussels University. Um, my, uh, I'm worried uh, about the fact that we say that not everybody will be using uh, Erasmus without paper, not even here in the room. Not every, everyone raised the hand. And I understand that this morning when two participants of Erasmus Without Papers collaborate, it's really easy to push a, a, button, a button and have the data in the system. But I'm afraid we will we'll have for a long time, many years, uh, students uh, arriving uh, in Bremen and uh, getting their uh, arrival date automatically pushed in the system and the student going to Hamburg who, who doesn't participate maybe in Erasmus without paper will still have this paper to have, have it signed uh, and etc. So we will have two systems um, running at the same time. Some students will go fully digital because uh, the host institution is participating and some other students will still have the, the, the paper version until everyone gets it. So uh, I'm not saying, or maybe I am saying that it should be, become mandatory. Uh, that would be the, the best solution because if it's mandatory, everyone is using it and 
uh, with the support we, we can get it. But if it's not mandatory, I'm afraid it could become one of the projects not really reaching anything because, well, I, I'm not doing it because I have to do, for 50% of my students, I still have to do manually. So why should I uh, participate? What is your answer to that? Okay. <laughs> there is an answer here. <laughs> The answer to this uh, problem, it, you, are, you are right, eh? you, you just uh, point out what, what the, the main uh, issue, but if you remember the presentation uh, from the European Commission in the morning, uh, they explained that we are already uh, preparing the launching of a, a, a project called My Academic ID, which is just uh, training to clarify the different use cases and the different uh, identifiers we, we can use if we want to organize something that would be a, a common portal of services for the students and for the institutions. So, uh, of course, the ambition is to open access and services for all students and all students and all types of mobility, not only uh, uh, the strict Erasmus mobility. So. I think that this is the main answer we can give to the, to the point you mentioned. Indeed, as I said, the idea is not to leave any university and not to leave any student behind. But I would like to also ask the panelists their idea about making it mandatory. Is this for you a possible way ahead? Just a short answer from the four of you to finish off our discussion here. May I start well, with Victoriano? Coming, coming from the identity and, and privacy world. Yep. This was solved. We had the problem with the previous directive for privacy. It was impossible to transfer data in Europe because every country had their own laws and it was so complicated that finally they came with the directive, uh, with, excuse me, with the regulation. regulation yes. So that's an idea for the commission. Go to the parliament and tell them that Erasmus, the new version of Erasmus, has to come with a regulation attached. If you want to participate, if you want money, this is the way to go. No paper. Okay, that's a very straightforward idea. <laughs> Rick? The only thing I would add is that um, I think the business case needs to be made, and it's not about people losing their jobs. It's actually about re they're, they are putting better focus and attention on students, which yeah. is what happened in the United States. They stopped doing clerical work and were serving the students much Very better. Important point. And if the dollars go round or the euros go round, okay, then, you know, the question is for the smaller mm -hmm. institutions, is there an on-ramp over time? Because sometimes they're just not technically able to make the change. So how much support will national or uh, agencies give them to actually make that change if the business case is there? And I think that could be the way to do this. Thanks. Louise? Um, yeah, I think it's definitely a question of uh, fears of, uh, of change. And uh, actually, the people who are working with all this paper now would be would, could, I think, really uh, notice the benefit of this uh, change with the digital tools. And I think it's sometimes good to push a bit with um, maybe mandatory <laughs> um, regulation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the key yeah. point is not uh, whether make it mandatory or not, is how we help the, the lie behind us to take use of the good tools. For Jessica's example, the uploading system are developed by us and for the like the U key and how to use it, we provide our staff to provide help for the for those institutions in taking advantage of these kind of digital tools. Thank you very much for this final contribution, but also for the uh, other very interesting and important suggestions of how we can proceed, how we can go further, how we can internationalize, so to say, Erasmus without paper. I would like to thank the panelists with a big round of applause. Thank you. And now it's time for, for closure. Valer. Okay, so thank you everyone for this afternoon, for, this, for today. 
Again, thank you to the university, uh, to Ghent University for the excellent support in various ways, uh, logistically and content-wise and everything. I think it's been a very interesting day. We still, we still have a lot of things to do tomorrow. You will get a more hands-on, perhaps even slightly more technical approach, but it will be interesting, we can promise you. Um, some of the things that I take with me today um, are, for example, the statement by the European Commission that there will be a, like a one-stop entry for the higher, education, for the higher institu education institutes and another one for the students. So that is, I think, in itself a very important statement. We are not talking about all kinds of stakeholders working separately. We are moving towards at least the idea and probably also the practice of having one-stop entries to this kind of thing. So, and this inevitably will lead to the integration of tools. And that was also a very important statement today. We have to integrate more, we have to cooperate more, we have to, to do these things. Um, <clears throat> of course, I talked a little bit about the history uh, of, of the Erasmus our paper project, but that's not so important. What is important is what is going on now and what we will do in the future. Um, and I think our launch was very successful under the capable hands of uh, Paul, but it also showed that it is actually possible to do these things. For the first time, I think, there were six servers connected in various ways at the same time in just one place. And let's face it, it went very smoothly, even better than we had anticipated. So. Thank you again for all that. Thank you for the technical team. As a non-technical person, I, can, I cannot express how much I appreciate this after all our discussions. But it's important that this kind of thing is possible. So the data were actually shown. It was a daring experiment, but we pulled it off. So thank you very much for everyone. That. We also saw and heard about the competence center, how it's going to make the life of the various stakeholders much more um, uh, easy. It still has to be worked out in detail, but a lot of these elements are already there. And that's, I think, the main message. A lot of our components are ready to be used. We have to still adjust a little bit. We have to, 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 to change them here and there, but they will be used. And um, so that's important. The dashboard as a management tool for the uh, online learning agreement also shows that a lot of things are already possible in, as it were, an, a non-online version, non-online in terms of direct exchange, but this will change very rapidly. Again, we're talking about the integration of various tools and various projects. Um, of course, we, are sure, we know and everyone has expressed this, this idea implementation will have to be done. It's not sure to what extent it will work. Uh, we have to be, uh, we heard that we have to avoid the digital divide whereby some universities will not be able to catch up. This is also one of the concerns that Rick mentioned. I think this is very important, but and should it be mandatory or not mandatory? Uh, in principle, that's a very important question. In practice, it may not, in fact, be such a problem. Who would have thought 20 years ago that bank checks are no longer in use in Europe at all? And 20 years ago, nothing else was possible. Or even bank transfer, I remember a time, it's not that long ago, that you had to go to the post office if you wanted to transfer some money to somebody, if you wanted to pay something. In theory, that is still possible today. You can still do it. But whom, how many people still do it? Hardly anyone. So that's the change of technology, the, the change of what is going to happen. And in fact, it will depend, and again, I, I'm quoting some of the people here, it will depend on how easy we make it for everyone to join this. That's where the real issue is. Let's make it easy, let's explain to people, let's show them what's happening and how they have to do them. Oh, yes, still there. One possible thing that we haven't really thought out yet, but which will also come is 
how does this tally with mobile applications? We have the, uh, the Erasmus Plus app, which is already showing at a vast potential from the point of view of the students. How do we integrate that so that it works together with the, with the institutions? And do we need something like that for institutions as well? Again, there now in the bank sector, a lot of things are changing. Uh, the other day, for the first time ever, I just put my bank card next to a machine and I had paid something. You see, this is a new development again. Huh? So these things are happening all the time. Who would have thought it five years ago even? So it's important to, to, to remember that, but it's even more important to think of the quality of our support. That's, that's more important than whether it will be mandatory or not. At least that's what I take away uh, from us. Of course, we will need the proper uh, uh, resources. We need the, the proper facilities. We need to work out how much money do we actually save and so on. All of these things are important. And the, the exercise that, uh, that uh, Rick suggests is a very good one. Uh, it's perhaps not always so easy to put it uh, real into euros that, that actually tally because the problem is you cannot always work out exactly how much does it cost. Um, only uh, last year I realized, for example, when I had to fill in the costs of, of, of my staff costs, how much I cost a day, and I was surprised myself. <laughs> so that's why uh, we have to have economies. Eh? Economies of scales were mentioned, that's important. We, um, and we hope that economies of scale will also create more efficiency, because it has to go together. We, had, we heard about the developers helping each other, the online, uh, sorry, the uh, open source um, alliance. That is uh, going to be very important. But what we also heard about, we had four submissions already. I'm sure this will develop more uh, to in, in 2019. But what is important, I think, is also this element of trust. Uh, we need to wor worry about privacy, we need about to worry about security, we need to worry about transparency, and all of that needs to trust. Once people trust the systems, once people feel they can use it, they will actually use it as well, and I think that is important. So, this will then automatically lead to cost efficiency, it will uh, be automatically lead to being more inclusive, and as you have, I'm sure you have undoubtedly seen, we want to be inclusive. We, we said several times, we don't want any university be, to be left uh, um, behind. And if it happens, as Rick was saying, that we will have, still have CVS files being sub, uh, submitted, then we will just have to make sure that we can import them and change them. Uh, that is another way of changing information. I mean, a long time ago, I learned how to change CVS into something which is more readable and so on. It's not that difficult, but it needs to be done. It needs to be taken into account and it needs to be accepted that some people will do that and nothing else. So that's important. This will definitely lead to more standardization. That is, uh, that is, um, the, uh, that is obviously the case. But again, I would like to, str to, str uh, to stress we will have a large uptake in Erasmus our paper in digitalization uh, itself as long as we have the support requ required to make people use it. And that's what I would like to end with. Let's make the support so good that people feel it is so much easier to use this and so more important to it. Thank you for today. Uh, we, we will be seeing you again tomorrow at 9 o'clock. We start sharp. You've seen we usually start right in time. And it, it will be in the same place, and uh, it will be a very nice uh, uh, morning again. If you want to take part in the uh, city tour in the afternoon, you have to register at the reception. Hopefully, most of you did, or did so already, but the, the student organization, ESN, and I would like to thank them for them. They're providing the guides, so um, we, they have to know exactly how many students they have to bring out uh, tomorrow.